Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on Climate Ready Scotland, the Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Minister, ten minutes. Presiding officer, um, today I lay before Parliament the Scottish Government's final Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme. This programme is in accordance with Section 53 of the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. There is no doubt in my mind that climate change poses one of the greatest threats to the world as we know it. The latest evidence uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change sends a stronger warning than ever that human activity is changing the global climate. On the 31st of March, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published the second volume of its fifth assessment report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. The evidence supports urgent action to reduce emissions to avoid dangerous climate change, but also the necessity to adapt to those changes that we can no longer avoid. Climate change is affecting every continent, contributing to heat waves, drought and flooding across the globe. Heavy rains and floods are not only now common here, but are also now commonplace in Africa, with devastating effects in countries such as Sudan and Somalia, while northeastern Brazil has experienced its worst drought in the past 50 years, and Typhoon Haiyan, one of the strongest storms ever to make landfall, devastated parts of the central Philippines with tragic results. The impact is also being seen in our seas and coastlines, with significant threat of coastal erosion, with up to an 82 centimetre global sea level rise by the end of this century. That would displace millions and cause massive damage to important natural habitats, as well as enormous economic damage. Scotland will not be immune, and we are already seeing evidence of Scotland's climate changing. Temperatures between 2003 and 2007 in Scotland were the highest since the rec record began in 1910. Average winter rainfall in the 1990s and 2000s was around 23% higher than the 1961 to 1990 baseline. And there is a trend of increasing rainfall intensity in parts of Scotland. As recently as this past winter, Scotland experienced the devastating effects extreme weather can bring. A succession of major winter storms from mid-December to early January saw disruption across Scotland's rail network and airports, several thousand homes without power, traffic accidents and fatalities. Dumfries and Galloway experienced severe flooding as the River Nith burst its banks and the Girvan in Ayrshire was recorded as being the highest for 16 years. In Scotland, some places uh, saw more than 600 millimetres of rainfall over a five-week period and overall it was the wettest December and wettest month overall in the records dating back to 1910. Although the aggregate impacts of climate change in Scotland might be less severe than in many other parts of the world, we will be faced with new challenges. Recent evidence uh, from the Met Office shows that when viewed over long-term averages, the UK is expected to see more milder, wetter winters and more hotter, drier summers in the future. But the UK has seasonal weather that also varies hugely from year to year due to natural processes. We should also plan to be resilient to wet summers and to cold winters through this century. Our Climate Change Act is still the most ambitious piece of climate change legislation anywhere in the world. And whilst there are no doubt many challenges ahead, Scotland is making progress with the biggest fall in emissions in Western Europe. However, despite our commitment to reduce emissions, the inertia of the climate systems means some degree of further climate change is inevitable over the coming decades. That is why the Scottish Government is not only fully committed to the greenhouse gas emission targets that the Act sets out, but also ensuring that Scotland is well prepared and resilient to the impacts of climate change. And in doing so, it has been important to consider the statutory requirements of the Climate Change Act when preparing the adaptation programme. The programme must set out the Scottish Minister's objectives in relation to adaptation to climate change, proposals and policies for meeting those objectives, and the period within which they will be introduced. The programme must also set out the arrangements for involving employers, trade unions, and other stakeholders in meeting Scottish Minister's objectives, and the mechanisms for ensuring public engagement in meeting those objectives. And uh, the programme must also address the risks in the UK climate change risk assessment. Our programme delivers on this. In terms of where we see our role in addressing climate change, Scotland does not lack ambition. As a nation, we can all take pride in that. The impacts of climate change will affect Scotland as a whole, and we all have a role to play in ensuring Scotland is well prepared and resilient to change. Wider engagement will be key to delivering our adaptation objectives. Adapting to the impacts of climate change will require a mixture of actions at local, national and international levels, and responsibility for adapting rests with organisations, businesses and communities across Scotland. 
While it is neither appropriate or feasible for the Scottish Government to directly prepare every organisation for the impacts of climate change, our adaptation programme provides a framework for everyone in Scotland to contribute towards the delivery of the objectives within their own organisation, business or community. Adaptation is about understanding and managing the risks and opportunities. It is about taking action through collective and mutual support, collaboration and partnership working. And it is about evaluation and review and being flexible in the face of uncertainty. Our programme does this by integrating adaptation within Scottish Government policies and strategies. It does this through helping people understand and plan for the risks and opportunities presented uh, by the changing climate and encouraging and facilitating partnership working. And it does this through regular monitoring and reporting. Committee scrutiny and responses to the public consultation have been invaluable in the development of the final programme, highlighting the strengths of the programme as well as areas where the programme could be developed further. Where appropriate, we have addressed uh, these in this programme and where this has not been possible, we will consider other areas in the longer term and for future programmes. Some areas where clarity was sought by the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee and consultation response, uh, respondents were on timescales, funding and responsibilities. On timescales, the schedule of work to develop and implement each policy and proposal in the adaptation programme will start from the position that the policy or proposal presently occupies in relevant government programmes. There are inevitable uncertainties in exact timescales across the broad range of policies and proposals in the programme, which is why the programme offers a broad definition of timescales. This is consistent with the approach taken in the report on proposals and policies published last year. With regards to funding, we're investing in and planning for the changing climate by firmly embedding climate change adaptation and related costs into the policies and proposals set out in the programme. We're also providing support and core funding for adaptation through the development of a robust evidence base, including annual funding to the Climate Exchange Adaptation Research Programme, uh, programmes to develop ad adaptive capacity, including Adaptation Scotland, and policy-specific action, including annual funding to the Scottish Flood Forum. And with regards to responsibilities, while the Scottish Government as a whole is responsible for the policies and proposals in the programme, we will work collaboratively with a wide range of partners to deliver the programme and work set out. Our adaptation programme contains many examples of adaptation actions in Scotland. This demonstrates that a wide range of organisations across Scotland are already taking responsibility for their share of action and working collaboratively to achieve results. Our programme provides a framework for activity, but it is not a statement on everything we are doing. The wide-ranging nature of impacts, the complex interactions and the emerging evidence means that our response must be adaptable. We should not be tied to a specific course of action. Work will continue outside of the programme as new evidence emerges and our understanding of the effects of climate change and their impacts develops. Of course, the programme is not an end in itself. Uh, due to the inherent uncertainty in some aspects of climate change, adaptation policies need to be flexible and adjusted as and when new information becomes available. Our policies and proposals will evolve and are de and developed during each programme, providing the flexibility needed in order to adjust to new understanding and information as it becomes available. We will use the framework set out in the programme to continue to integrate adaptation within Scottish Government policies and strategies and encourage and facilitate partnership working. This ongoing development of the Scottish Government's action will be reflected in regular reports and progress and in future adaptation programmes. Work is already underway with the Climate Exchange and the Adaptation Subcommittee of the UK Committee on Climate Change to consider indicators against which progress can be assessed. I believe Scotland's first statutory climate change uh, adaptation programme contains a comprehensive package of measures that makes clear the Scottish Government's ongoing commitment to ensuring Scottish Government policy as far as possible. It helps Scotland adapt to the effects of climate change, creates a more resilient country for us to live and work in, and helps to protect Scotland's much-loved natural environment. Presiding officer, in closing, I, I just want to thank all those who have helped to shape the programme that we've laid before Parliament today, and I look forward to taking questions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow you 20 minutes or so for questions, after which we need to move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question or to press the request to speak button now, and I call Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I firstly thank the Minister for sight of the statement? Uh, the Scottish Government is, of course, legally required to produce clim the Climate Adaptation Programme. The overarching aim being, and I quote, to increase the resilience of Scotland's people, environment and economy to the impacts of climate change. 
However, I have to say that I'm disappointed in the process this afternoon because it really has been impossible to assess in any real sense the, the actual pr final programme, which we only received 20 minutes before this statement. So I hope there'll be further opportunity um, in the future, um, in the chamber, um, to, to scrutinise the document. Um, we are, I'm, I must stress, very keen to continue to work in a cross-party manner on these important long-term issues. Thus, there are some brief initial questions. How does the Minister envisage that the programme will help achieve the future annual emissions targets after some initial difficulties? And in, in the statement, the Minister does highlight, I quote, a broad definition of timescales. In view of the criticisms of the programme by some stakeholders being too short term, what plans does the Minister have to extend it beyond the first five years in line with the RPP structure? Monitoring is essential, and the Minister uh, agreed with the Rural Affairs Committee, I quote, is crucial to develop indicators which effectively measure progress towards the aims and objectives. Um, beyond the organisations involved, can the Minister give some details of what the plans are for monitoring? And in the Minister's statement, he does recognise the challenges faced last winter. Given that roughly 18% of Scotland's coastline is highly susceptible to erosion, our, our committee heard that careful targeting of areas is needed to make them more resilient. The Minister confirmed, and I quote, that this was actively being considered by the Scottish Government. Has this been developed? And lastly, um, there I are think urban... you're way over time. I think I'm being extremely generous. Could I, I think... just finish with one sentence? I I'll allow the Minister to answer your questions. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and I do apologise to uh, Claudia Beamish and other members if there were technical problems getting the documents to, to them today. Uh, but I'll endeavour to answer the other questions that Claudia uh, Beamish has raised if I don't get through them all. Um, uh, how, do we, uh, how does it help inform the uh, achievement of emission targets? Clearly, um, the more that the public understand the importance of climate change, how it's going to affect our lives, how it will affect communities, business, uh, and uh, our, the wider society that we face through the adaptation programme and the influence it has on, on behaviours. I think that will then also lock in potentially uh, positive behavioural change to help us with our emission targets. Hopefully help, by, uh, help communities understand why certain things have to happen from an adaptation point of view and indeed a climate mitigation point of view as well. So I would hope it will set a more positive narrative that there has been perhaps in the past about why certain investments, certain land use changes have to occur in order to facilitate climate mitigation because of the unapproved understanding of adaptation and why it's so important to us as a society. In terms of timescales, there are a mixture uh, of timescales set out in the document. This reflects the nature that it is an organic document. It will change over time. It refers to land use strategy. It refers to other key government documents, which will themselves change over time, such as planning policy and land use strategy, which is shortly to be under review, as, as Claudia Beamish will know. So it would be a mistake to have specific text in from those documents or to be too rigid in how the document is structured. So we have maintained a degree of flexibility so it can evolve over time and reflect change as it happens. Uh, but there are some specific uh, details in there about uh, Scottish Waters Investment Programme, page 74, which is quite specific about uh, the timelines. Uh, similarly, Historic Scotland's Action Plan over 2012 to 2017. Uh, but there are other areas, perhaps, where, um, uh, and the flood, indeed flood risk management, where we have a deadline for the end of the year for local strategies to be developed. But the, um, in, other, in other areas, we've been more, uh, more flexible because these are strategies that will be evolving and timelines are not yet certain. And of course, we don't know uh, at this point in time exactly how climate change will unfold because a lot will depend on how much action the world takes to address climate mitigation and therefore what scenario in terms of temperature rise we face as a society. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, what actions will the Scottish Government take to ensure that each governmental department will put climate change and climate change adaption high enough on their agenda to effectively mitigate the public sector's environmental footprints. What can be done to incentivise peatland retention and restoration as a way of absorbing more CO2? The adaption programme suggests that parts of Scottish agriculture and forestry might experience positive change as a result of changes in our climate. Can the Minister give details of what research is being done on this so that some producers might be able to benefit? And lastly, with regard to the Farming for a Better Climate programme, how will the government highlight the financial savings that have been achieved on the focus farms to all other farmers and crofters in order to spread best practice? Thank you. Minister. Uh, 
Um, I should have known better than to stand up after the first question when Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy McGregor started. Um, I'll try and answer as best I can, but again, I will pick up anything I missed today. Uh, in terms of leadership, we have the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum. Uh, at its most recent meeting, and, and Claudia Beamish attended this as an observer for the committee, uh, we discussed uh, adaptation and the five key steps that we can take as a, as, as in terms of the public sector to help adra address adaptation. So I can assure uh, Jamie McGregor it's something that does feature in terms of the cross-government departmental conversations about how we, uh, how we adapt to climate change. And indeed, the document itself had extensive input from every government department in terms of their own specific portfolio interests to make sure it reflected um, both what could be undertaken, but also the risks and challenges that each, uh, each area face. And most obviously in areas like transport, that's critical that we understand the impact on critical infrastructure, energy sector and other areas, and then get feed in from the, from the specialists. So that has been a core part of producing the document we laid before Parliament today. But I assure uh, Jamie McGregor that we will continue that cross-portfolio engagement and adaptation. Um, I, I, farming for better climate, I know the Cabinet Secretary was making an announcement today about um, further, further funding for that. Uh, it's certainly a very important programme and I, just to give an, a flavour of it, I know at least two of the monitoring farms had between them 11 and 10 per cent uh, reduction in carbon uh, dioxide emissions and uh, commensurate benefits, financial benefits to their underlying business as well. So it's not only good for the environment, but very good for them as businesses. But I will obviously undertake to give further feedback on the points that Mr McGregor raised. Thank you, Minister. We have 11 backbenchers who wish to ask a question of the Minister. Can I ask that the questions are short, i.e. one question? And can I ask that the answers are equally brief? Rob Gibson, followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Turning to the Climate Ready Society uh, section, uh, this adaptation programme includes the need for effective public engagement uh, in meeting the adaptation objectives. Can the Minister expand on the triggers that will make action possible beyond government uh, so that the crucial involvement of families, communities, public bodies, private business and local authorities are taken into account? Minister. Well, Rob Gibson is very right to raise this. I mean, I did allude to it in my, uh, my opening remarks, but um, clearly communities, businesses and uh, individuals all have an extremely important role to play. And if we can, um, as I was in responding to Claudia Beamish, say, influence their behaviours, uh, both in adaptation, it will obviously have a knock-on impact on tackling climate change itself. Public bodies and local authorities can play a vital role in helping supporting communities and businesses in this respect. And the Scottish Government is helping to facilitate that in a number of ways, principally through providing leadership. Obviously, we've got the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum, I referred to in answering Jamie McGregor, uh, our support for the 2020 Climate Group, uh, which provides strategic direction for action in the business sector. We can provide advice and guidance through Adaptation Scotland, who work with public bodies, uh, organisations and communities to take action, and our support for climate exchange on uh, working with a range of stakeholders on specific research projects and pilots. And we obviously want to provide financial support as well through measures such as Climate Challenge Fund to help communities at a local level. Cara Hilton, followed by Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you. How does the Climate Change Adaption Programme relate to Low Carbon Scotland's behaviour framework, and how will this be monitored? Minister. Well, it's a, it's a good point uh, that, uh, that uh, is raised there by Cara Hilton because we have, certainly in, in outlining our action on climate mitigation, played a lot of uh, strength on ISM, the Individual Social Material um, Modelling Tool, which helps government to understand what the implications are in terms of behavioural triggers for uh, change in terms of climate mitigation, but also in terms of adaptation. So we can equally apply that approach in understanding the individual circumstances, the social context in which people are living and working, and indeed the kind of triggers, the material kind of triggers and regulatory powers and things that may trigger a change in behaviour. So and understanding the, the behavioural aspects of climate policy it helps us inform government and other public sector agencies and indeed business how they can best influence that behaviour in a positive way. So certainly ISM, which I, I'm happy to, if, if, the, if the member's not already got information, I'm happy to provide that to her so she's got further detail. Roderick Campbell, followed by Jane Bax. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, can you provide further information on, on the support and funding for adaptation? Minister. Um, well, in, indeed, the, the, the adaptation funding we have uh, outlined already uh, a, a good degree of work in terms of flood risk management. Uh, as, as the member knows, uh, we provide £42 million a year through uh, local government capital settlement uh, on uh, flood protection. But in addition to that, we have to provide uh, support to public bodies in terms of implementing the climate change duties, uh, guidance on fulfilling. We provide uh, 
uh, informational guidance in terms of climate change adaptation duties and how they can comply with them. Um, guidance for public, third and business sector partners uh, is disseminated through Adaptation Scotland, who we provide core funding to uh, the five steps to managing your climate risks are referred to in responding to Jamie McGregor, business climate risk management plan and supporting communities through a new resource, Are You Ready? Uh, and, uh, and direct engagement with communities. We do also provide core funding for development of robust evidence base, about £1 million annually, uh, to fund climate exchange adaptation research programme, uh, programmes to develop adaptive capacity, including funding of around a quarter of a million pounds for Adaptation Scotland to help organisations and communities, and policy-specific actions, including annual funding of £140,000 to the Scottish Flood Forum to help them support communities affected by flooding or at risk of flooding. Jane Baxter, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you. Can the Minister reassure the Chamber that the mechanisms are in place to ensure the Scottish Government and partners are able to assess how to adapt and respond to the needs at hand and to new research as it arises, as argued by Scottish Environment Link? Minister. Well, uh, research is clearly very important. That's why we do fund climate exchange to undertake the, the, the work I outlined earlier. Uh, I think it's very important to emphasise we have, uh, both in terms of the sort of leadership forum that we held last year to discuss with business and public sector uh, stakeholders and community stakeholders how we work together to show leadership in climate change, but also, as I say, the public, uh, public sector climate leaders forum, which has uh, just been re-established uh, and which um, the Rural Affairs Committee has an ob observer role in it, is a very important uh, forum for us to identify um, how we can work together, learn from each other in terms of there are initiatives perhaps happening in the private sector, the public sector can learn from and vice versa in terms of steps that are being taken. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are lots of good behaviours already happening. Indeed, councils, not ones necessarily always under the SNP control, that are doing very good things. Uh, and I'd like to make sure that we disseminate good practice and make sure local authorities across the country are sharing that knowledge and making sure that we take it forward. So research, both informal and formal, I think is very important. But sharing information and best practice is also crucial to make sure we, we achieve uh, quick results in terms of uh, both adapting and mitigating climate change. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Sarah Boyer. Uh, I draw uh, members' attention to my entry in the Register of Interests in relation to my membership of the IAM. In relation to objective B312, improving driver skills, is the minister aware that driving 10 miles an hour slower delivers 10% cash savings and 10% emissions savings for only 2 to 3 per cent average speed reduction on journeys. Will the Minister commission uh, work to identify how we might take forward uh, a response to that in a Scottish context? Minister. Um, well, I, uh, I certainly know that Stuart Stevenson has a long-standing interest in this issue. And uh, in terms of the, the issue he raises, yes, reducing speed will have a benefit in terms of reducing emissions uh, through fuel-efficient driving. And I know uh, Stuart Stevenson took close interest in this issue. We are enabling people to become responsible drivers, reducing emissions uh, and across not only speed control but other measures such as gear selection when they're sort of more efficiently driving. We have funded Energy Saving Trust uh, to provide 2,000 fuel goods sessions uh, this year uh, but we're also continuing looking at demand to ensure we can support as many drivers as possible. On the specific issue about whether we commission work, uh, I will have a discussion with Mr Brown about this. It does kind of cut across uh, Mr Brown's portfolio interests of course uh, so I will I promise to, to raise that issue with Mr Brown and see if there is possibility of looking at what the, what the impact could be on our climate uh, emission targets. Sarah Boyd, followed by Graham Day. Will the Minister publish the number of houses uh, which have benefited from energy efficiency and renewables installations year by year and by local authority so that we can monitor this key ambition of the Climate Change Act in reducing emissions and eradicating fuel poverty and thereby enabling us to track progress and identify obstacles to progress? Minister. Uh, well, I... I certainly recognise the importance of the issue that Sarah Boyd raises. I know it's something that's of close personal interest to her. We've discussed it before. Um, I'm happy to have a discussion with colleagues about how we can produce that kind of information. It's more about mitigation, clearly, than, than about adaptation, but it is also an adaptation impact, so I, I see the relevance of it because we've obviously got more erratic weather and, and people will be exposed to uh, poor weather conditions, as we saw in 2010, which unfortunately impacted on our, our achievement of targets. So uh, I, I do see the significance of it. But I haven't got an answer for today, but I will need to discuss with colleague Margaret Burgess just what we might be able to do in terms of what the data is that's available. But I can say to the member that we are uh, looking at uh, publishing more information in line with the requests from committees in the Parliament about how we're monitoring our progress against RPP2, which hopefully will help uh, to inform that kind of understanding. 
Graham Day, followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Extreme weather patterns, ranging from intense and sustained periods of wetness to lengthy, very dry spells, create difficulties for the agricultural sector in Scotland. Can I ask the Minister what thought, if any, has been given to encouraging water storage projects on farmland to ensure that when the heavens open, we are banking the downfall for the far less rainy days to come and thereby protecting food production? Minister. Well, it is uh, certainly the flip side of something that we do discuss on a regular basis, which is about uh, how we use uh, natural flood management to prevent flooding in communities. And I think there are opportunities out of the uh, recently published flood risk hazard maps uh, and hazard maps which show and clearly identify areas for uh, natural flood management, which could potentially be used. Uh, as stores of water for areas that are going to suffer erratic weather conditions and, and, and periodic droughts versus flooding incidents. So I think it's an interesting area. I'm happy to meet with Mr Day just to, to see what uh, particular ideas he may have in that regard and if there's any particular opportunities to look at that in Angus. Jim Hume, followed by Nigel Dawn. Thank you. The Minister uh, mentioned the severe flooding in the southwest of my region on the River Nith uh, back in January. Uh, I know the farming community has been badly affected there, and I know the Minister will be aware of an application for funding support to construct flood defences supported by Dumfries and Galloway Council. Can the Minister provide an assurance that this request will be looked upon favourably? Minister. Well, clearly we recognise the particularly uh, st stressful situation that was faced in Dumfries and Galloway over the Christmas and festive period uh, with the uh, w welcome, I'm sure it was welcomed by Jim Hume, the announcement of additional funding for Dumfries and Galloway Council to address the damage that had been suffered uh, to flood defences in the area. I mean, there is obviously a longer term issue about what we do to help communities like Dumfries and Galloway adapt to uh, climate change. And that is why we are looking closely at options for further extending the flood warning systems in the area and also to uh, we will look sympathetically at the bids that come forward from Dumfries and Galloway Council, but they, they obviously have to comply with the criteria that are set in partnership with COSLA. Unfortunately, the recent, uh, uh, recent process, uh, Dumfries and Galloway's bid was not yet complete and therefore unable to be, uh, to be approved at this time. But we will look sympathetically at the needs of the Michael Dawn, followed by Graham Pearce. Dear Presiding Officer, I'm wondering if I can just extend that and whether the Minister would agree with me that one of the consequences of, of large amounts of water falling out of the sky is that they come down pre-existing watercourses, so we know where the major floods are actually going to be. We accept that. W would the Minister agree with me that one of the things that we could best do is to ensure that the capital is expended early rather than later, because the risk is there and the sooner we can mitigate that risk, the better. Uh, and I think we get the question, Minister. Well, certainly I uh, recognise the, the point that's been made, certainly both in climate mitigation and climate adaptation, there is a very good argument to make that early action does help avoid longer term higher costs. Uh, so that's why it's important we maintain our commitment to £42 million a year through the local government capital settlement uh, to support flood protection uh, and investment. And so given undertaking to Nigel Zorn, we've continued to have a very high priority on that and we'll look to continue to make that kind of strategic investment. Graham Pearson, then finally Alison Johnson. Uh, following on from the point that Nigel Dons just made, communities like New Cumnock and Ayrshire know from better experience investment in flood prevention and resilience is paramount. I understand the nature of funding for flood defence is now primarily dependent on local authorities and not central government. Uh, we are aware, however, we need a question, Mr. Pearson. We are aware that significant underfunding is reported by some local authorities. Is the, is the Minister aware and does he anticipate what the impact of that underfunding might be? Minister. Yeah, there are ongoing discussions with COSLA about how we uh, f further fund uh, flooding in the future, so I reassure um, uh, Mr Pearson on that. But in terms of flood protection funding, just to put on the record, we, we have uh, provided in recent years about the equivalent of three times as much funding on capital uh, for flood protection as is done in, uh, through DEFRA in England and Wales, or England, sorry, uh, per, per property at risk. So we are making a, a high level of investment relative to the scale of risk there is in Scotland, but I, I certainly assure Mr Pearson that we're working closely with COSLA on how we continue to allocate funding in the future. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Will a long-term approach to the management of surface water to ensure that sewer systems are resilient to climate change encourage the use of permeable landscaping and planning guidance wherever appropriate, as well as the replacement of Victorian and other age drainage and sewer systems which are no longer fit for purpose? Minister. Um, in short answer, we, we were sympathetic in that point. Mr Mackay is happy to look at that. And uh, I, I understand the issue that's been made, certainly the concreting over of many gardens and is, has contributed to overloading sewers in some places. Uh, but we'll, we'll happily look at that issue for Alison Johnston. 
Can I thank the Minister and the members for your cooperation? Uh, we are finished bang on time. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10147 in the name of Hamza Yusuf on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland. Members who wish to speak in this debate should press to request to speak buttons now. I will give a few seconds to allow the front benches to change over. I now call Hamza Yusuf to speak to move the motion. Minister, 13 minutes. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to bring this important issue before Parliament. Higher education is one of Scotland's greatest and most valued assets. It has a key role in supporting and developing our country, uh, our economy, our culture uh, and indeed our society. Many of us, if not most of us, benefited uh, from a great university education. I uh, look at the, the opposition front bench, you see O'Neill Bibby, Kezia Dugdale, some of us, uh, including myself, a little bit more recent than others. I couldn't possibly comment uh, on others across this chamber. But oh, many of us uh, enjoy that great university uh, experience. Uh, last, well, you can have mature students too, of course. <laughs> last year, the British Council's Distinctive Assets Report identified five key features of the Scottish higher education sector. Uh, joined up in collaborative <laughs> sector, uh, quality assurance and credit recognition procedures that are owned by all universities, uh, graduate employability and employment, innovative structures uh, and research excellence. Uh, today, however, we wish to discuss some of the negative impacts we can already see from the UK government's immigration policies upon Scotland's higher education asset, uh, but also the opportunities that an independent Scotland would provide to address this threat to our institutions. In November 2012, Professor Pete Downes, as convener of University Scotland, rightly praised the brilliant track record of excellence driven growth and international recruitment by universities in Scotland and in the UK. But he warned, and I quote, as I scan the policy horizon, it's hard to see a bigger risk or a more poisonous gun pointed at our collective success. This was his view of the rapid and negative changes to the UK's immigration system, changes which make it increasingly difficult for international students to come to Scotland and to the rest of the UK to study. Uh, Professor Downes was right then, uh, and today his concerns are still shared across the Scottish higher education sector by this government. Uh, one month uh, ago today, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning set out to the Education and Culture Committee what independence will mean for his portfolio and highlighted the very real and indeed the very urgent need to ensure that Scottish universities can continue to attract the brightest and the best students and researchers from across the world. Uh, presiding officer, uh, I'm determined that we take a positive approach to establishing an immigration system which sustains and extends Scotland's brilliant track record and removes completely the threat of that poisonous gun. Scotland is a highly attractive destination for international students. Our higher education system is underpinned by world-class research, a tremendous breadth of learning, including internationalisation, and a focus on enhancing all aspects of graduate employability. Scottish education is known across the globe for its excellence in many of the countries that I've personally travelled in this role. That is often mentioned to me by the highest levels of government. People know of the five institutions uh, that we have, world-class institutions in the top 200. Scotland's research is cited by other researchers around the world more than any other country in comparison to our GDP. The British Council also highlighted last year that the overall learning satisfaction of international students in Scotland was better than that uh, of the rest of the UK and many of our European counterparts. And I can tell you uh, we still have that. Uh, just last week, the Student Academic Experience Survey of 15,000 students found that uh, of the four home nations, Scotland had the highest level of respondents, 88%, that declared themselves as fairly or very satisfied with the overall quality of their course. And add to that uh, Scotland's natural assets, its beauty, its friendly cities, its world-renowned festivals, uh, great infrastructure, and it's clear that this country is a wonderful place to study and a highly attractive destination for international students. I'm very proud that Scotland has one of the highest proportion of international students in the world. 2012-2013, uh, there were 28,305 international students at all levels of our universities from uh, over 180 countries of the world. 
but beneath these figures, uh, the negative impact of the UK government's immigration policies are being seen and are being felt. Uh, the number for non-EU enrolments, the numbers for all years uh, of study, uh, is, is, is 0.7 per cent lower than the previous year. But that also masks a very worrying drop in new entrants uh, from countries particularly like Pakistan and India, uh, two countries where traditionally uh, they've sent high numbers of students to study in Scotland and who have enriched our lives uh, here in Scotland over the decades. In March 2011, uh, the UK government uh, announced uh, the intention to close the post-study work uh, visa route in April 2012. And in the two years since then, we've seen that the number of new entrants to Scottish higher education institutes uh, from India decreased by 58%, from Pakistan decreased by 38%, and from Nigeria decreased and fell by 22%. Of course... Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. Um, would he perhaps inform the, the Chamber whether, since the changes to visa rules were introduced, the number of students coming uh, from non-EU countries to study at Scottish universities has gone up or gone down? Minister. Uh, as I say, the total enrolment, uh, as I said in the, in, in the remarks earlier on, has decreased by 0.7%. Uh, um, so, yeah, and from India, as I said, 58%, Pakistan, 38%, Nigeria, uh, 22%. Uh, these figures, yes. Kezia Dugdale. I can help the Minister by telling them that the actual number of students from outside the EU has gone up every year since 2007-8. It went up by 11% in the last year alone. Unfortunately, the number of uh, people at college, the number of international students from outside the EU going to college is halved. Does he regret that colleges aren't featuring as part of the debate today? Minister. Uh, no, I will certainly speak about colleges as my remarks uh, continue uh, to go forward. Uh, yeah, Scotland's colleges provided a very good briefing, I thought, uh, in terms of how they've also been impacted by UKBA's policies. I saw the brief before I came in, and I'll happily mention uh, colleges uh, as I go on. Uh, these figures, uh, I will make some progress, and I will let uh, my good friend in uh, later on. Uh, these figures demonstrate, as I say, the real threat. Uh, but it's not just in Scotland we feel that. Also, the largest decrease in England uh, was in the first year entrance from India. That was down... 23% in a single year. Uh, Daniel Stevens, NUS International Students Officer, said many international students feel unwelcome in the UK as a result of the government's hostile and overzealous policies. But it's not just comparisons with other parts of the UK, but also if you look at Scotland's position relative to our key competitors across the globe. Uh, while the number of uh, international students in Scottish HEIs uh, has fallen between 2011-12 and 2012-13, the figures for our main competitors in the English-speaking uh, world uh, and, and university markets has increased. 0.4% uh, growth in Australia, 7% growth in the United States, and 11% growth in Canada. According to University of Scotland, uh, the number of students going from India to Australia has increased by 70%. I strongly believe the crucial difference between Scotland with our falling numbers and our competitors with their strong growth is the ability to set our own immigration policies that supports and enhances our higher education sector. Uh, the view that I say is also, oh, sorry, yes, I will let my, my colleague. Prince Alan Malik. Thank you very much. Um, I just wondered that, I know that you went to India and Pakistan very recently and on your return, I understand that the government, the Scottish government reduced its marketing budget by 50% for India and Pakistan. Do you think that's had an impact in the redu 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 reduction in numbers? Minister, can members remember to speak through the chair, please? Sure. Uh, the, the international uh, marketing, actually, in Scotland, if you look at the progress we've made, we're higher up the brand index than we've ever been before. Uh, the Lonely Planet said that we were third in the 2014 guide behind uh, Brazil and, I think, uh, Antarctica. So I think we're doing well, even though the fact that our budget has been slightly reduced. Uh, that is a direct impact of the cuts that we've received. But still, Scotland has managed to do very well. Uh, but I would say it would be ridiculous to equate that uh, with the very uh, overzealous uh, and regressive immigration policies, which I know the member also has concerns about too. Uh, the view from the sector is very much shared. Uh, Professor Anton Muscatelli wrote, uh, the UK government, and I quote, is trying its best to destroy a global brand. There might not be quotas for overseas students in the UK, but the impact of the government's anti-immigration rhetoric has had the same effects. Uh, that is the view that this government shares also. Uh, in the same article, Dr Scott Blinder, Director of the Migration Observatory at Oxford University, said that it's public opinion that research has shown that a large majority of Scots would like Holyrood rather than Westminster to make immigration policy uh, for Scotland. 
that Lord Krebs, the chair of the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee, said in April this year, and I quote again, the overwhelming evidence led us to conclude that changes to the immigration rules in this country have played a direct part in putting overseas students off from choosing the UK, and we call on the UK government to overhaul its immigration policies. In particular, it needs to do away with the new rules on working after studying. Uh, presenting officer, I think back to my own uh, student days and I reflect uh, upon them and I think of the many friends uh, that I still have to this very day from across the world that enri enriched my uh, university experience. The Richer For It report by University of Scotland in September identifies a number of uh, key qualitative benefits of internationalisation of our higher education sector, but perhaps even easier to quantify is a significant economic contribution made by international students. Now, Scottish HEI has received an overall income of 374 million in 2012-13 from non-EU international students uh, and their tuition fees. But also, of course, international students pay uh, accommodation fees, they contribute to the Scottish economy in other ways, and round about to the tune of 441 million uh, per year. However, it's a longer term impact on the economy uh, of the immigration policies that are also important. Uh, to, to, to take note of. Director of the Institute of Directors, David Watt, said earlier this year, we have an immigration policy in the UK that's largely led by the southeast of England and it's a significant problem for Scotland. Not my words, but the words of David Watt from the Institute of Directors. In fact, even uh, Theresa May over the weekend, the Home Secretary, seemed to dismiss the arbitrary cap that the UK government has put on reducing immigration numbers by, quote, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. Uh, this government completely rejects the negative re uh, rhetoric with regards to immigration and welcomes the contributions that migrants make to our society, to our economy and to our future. Uh, that is why in Scotland's future, the white paper, uh, the vision for an independent Scotland, uh, with our taking the responsibility of immigration, uh, we promise to introduce a controlled uh, immigration system but one that meets our social, economic and cultural needs. And an uh, important part of that will be the reintroduction of the post-study work visa. That fresh talent visa, so popular when it was first introduced in 2004 by the previous administration, one that we welcomed enthusiastically at the time, so popular that it was replicated by the rest of the UK. Uh, but uh, for that uh, crude uh, arbitrary cap that the present UK government wishes to fulfil, of course they removed and withdrew that post-study work visa, a classic case of throwing the baby uh, out with the bathwater. International students uh, and some of our universities tell me that they value very much and valued uh, that post-study work visa. Wherever I travel across the world in countries like India and Pakistan in particular, there is, uh, if nothing else, at least a very negative perception that the UK uh, is closing its borders. So in conclusion, presiding uh, officer, I'm clear that the current UK approach in immigration is damaging Scotland's ability to compete in the international student market. Uh, Scotland is a welcoming place, uh, open for academic and research business, uh, and more than willing uh, that those talents stay with us for those who wish to build careers here and build livelihoods here uh, too. Student migration is positive for Scotland in economic terms and academic terms and social terms and cultural terms too. And with the levers that independence will afford us, we'll be able to move away from that negative rhetoric of the UK government and its restrictive immigration policies. We'll also be in a stronger position to promote Scotland and her universities overseas with a ded dedicated diplomatic uh, uh, trade uh, network as well. We'll ensure that the immigration policies we introduce, including the post-study work visa, will allow Scotland to attract and retain world-class talent contributing to our education system and the Scottish economy. Uh, presenting officer, I move this motion in my name. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call Neil Bibby to speak to and move Amendment 10147.3. Around nine minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. The Labour Party always welcomes the chance to discuss how we improve higher education in Scotland, and we therefore welcome the debate this afternoon and the opportunity to examine the role that immigration plays in our higher education system. On this side of the chamber, we recognise the important role that international students play and also make clear our opposition to the coalition's government's approach to immigration, particularly with regard to higher education, but also to raise our belief that the Scottish Government could also be doing more 
to attract international students. Much of the Government's motion today touches on the damaging effect of the Tory-led UK Government's immigration policies on universities, and I do not disagree. But it would be extremely naive to believe it is only our universities that are facing up to this challenge. I share the view of Mary Senior from the Universities and College Union, who told the Education and Culture Committee on the 25th uh, of March that the UK Government's immigration policy is holding back not only universities in Scotland, but universities right across the UK. The Labour Party acknowledges the huge contribution that immigrants have made to Scotland and, over the, UK, and the UK over many decades and continue to make today to our universities and colleges. And I mention colleges deliberately, presiding officer, because the Scottish Government have yet uh, again ignored further education in their motion today. The Colleges Scotland briefing for this debate highlighted there has been a significant drop in the number of foreign students in our colleges. But when the Scottish Government have overseen a staggering 140,000 cut in the number of students from anywhere going to college in Scotland, this should not come as a surprise. This trend needs to be urgently addressed, and it is the Scottish Government that is responsible for that trend. It is precisely because the Labour Party recognises the positive contribution that inter international students make to our education system and our communities that the First Minister, Jack McConnell's administration, introduced the Fresh Talent Initiative in 2004. The Fresh Talent Initiative was a bespoke programme designed specifically to address the biggest challenge facing Scotland, a declining population. Central to the initiative was the the plan to allow overseas graduates from Scottish universities who express an intention to live and work in Scotland to stay on for two years following the completion of their course to seek employment. It is important to recognise that this required the Scottish Executive working to secure the powers to do so within a devolved parliament. Despite what this uh, government says, we can. I certainly. Well, Minister? Uh, I agree that the situation that we have at present is simply unacceptable, whereby uh, an administration may well introduce something as laudable as the Fresh Talent Initiative, only for another UK government to come and completely withdraw it against the very interest of Scotland. It would not be better to have the power here, retain it, so that no other parliament and no other government could get rid of that policy intention? Neil Bevy. Well, I, th I think it would surprise the Minister a great, uh, a great deal if I was to suggest that um, we should become independent of our own immigration uh, policy. I do not uh, subscribe. Uh, to that view, because despite um, what the government says uh, week in, week out, it does go to show uh, where there is political will to achieve change. That is possible. That was what was achieved back in 2004. What is more, although uh, only announced in February 2004, the Fresh Talent Working uh, Scotland scheme was operated uh, by the following summer and covered students who were graduating that year. On this side of the chamber, we are proud that we took uh, that approach in 2004. We are proud that we secured the agreements to make uh, that happen as quickly as it did in 2005. And in 2008, as the Minister said, the scheme was taken over by the UK uh, Wide Scheme, which looked to bring in immigrants in a positive, engaging way. Our connection with that initiative and our commitment to encouraging international students to help Scotland flourish is all the more reason why we disagree with the changes that the coalition government have made since. But the success in creating the Fresh Talent Initiative shows that we can tackle this issue using the force of political will and using creative policies. The First Minister was talking about. Yes, I'll give way. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. And I agree with his point about the importance of political will, but would you concede that uh, an infinite amount of political will is of little assistance uh, when there is no constitutional power with which to use it? Yes. Neil Bibby. No. Uh, and the reason for that is. Um, if, if members will care to listen. The First Minister was talking about Wales today. He was talking about Wales in terms of the NHS. Perhaps the Scottish Government should look at Wales in terms of uh, attracting international students and see what lessons can be learned there. Because in Wales, Labour has the largest proportion uh, of international postgraduates in the UK at 41 per cent, compared to 36 per cent in Scotland. After the coalition government brought in end to the Fresh Talent Initiative in 2010-11, many would have expected uh, to see a drop in overseas students coming uh, to study here. Now, the statistics have, uh, various statistics have already uh, been mentioned. On review of the figures, it suggests that the number of international students uh, the following year of 2011-12 actually rose 2% 2 from uh, 27,880 to 28,500. 
But I would accept, as the Minister has said, that we do need to look at that in detail because there is a variance in, uh, in levels from different uh, countries. In looking at these statistics, though, we must acknowledge, as the Tory amendment does, uh, that the student visa system has been uh, open to abuse in some circumstances. So we do need to look closely at the issue of temporary student visitors for short courses uh, visas if, if they are being abused, and, I, and, and Labour accepts that, and I know that's in the Conservative uh, amendment, and I'm sure all parties would, would agree uh, with that. Presiding officer, the SNP uh, want uh, to use this debate to talk about uh, the Coalition's immigration policy um, as a threat to the future of our higher education system. And as proud as I am of Labour's delivery of the very system that has been rolled back, uh, the numbers do show that overseas students are continuing to come here to study. Indeed, their numbers continue to increase after the change of the system. So as much as I disagree with the condemned government's policies, that is what the statistics show. However, we do fear that it could be damaging over time. However, the reality that we believe is that independence is the biggest threat to higher education in Scotland. President officer, just two weeks ago, I spoke in a debate on life sciences and highlighted the benefits to Scotland of a single research system across the UK, a funding system that gives a disproportionate level of research funding to our excellent universities. The facts speak for themselves. In 2012-13, Scottish higher education institutions secured £257 million of UK Research Council grants. That represents 13.1 per cent of the UK total, which is significantly more than our 8 per cent of UK gross domestic product and 8.4 per cent of the UK population. The reality is the best way to keep being part of the UK Research Council funding is to keep, part, uh, keep being part of the UK. It would also be remiss not to recognise the positive role that UK embassies play in promoting our universities around the world. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office operates in more than 170 countries, giving our universities a global presence and actively encouraging people from all over the world to come to Scotland and study. Leaving the UK means leaving the global network. Certainly uh, give way on that point. Minister. Why does, why does the member, uh, while reflecting on the good work that's done by UK embassies, why do you think that an independent Scotland's Scottish embassies that promote Scotland 365 days a year yeah. would be incapable of doing that job on a much better scale? Neil Bebby. Well, I think the UK embassies promote the UK and Scotland 365 days a year. But the fact is, there's, they, they're operated in 170 countries. And I, I, I welcome perhaps more details from you, uh, Minister, on how many embassies an independent Scotland's going to have, because it certainly isn't going to be the same level that we've got in the United Kingdom at the moment. Uh, Presiding officer, we do want to attract foreign uh, students. We want to make it possible for people from overseas to come to Scotland to work, study and live. We want Scotland to be a welcoming and inclusive country, as I'm sure everyone in the Chamber does. That's why uh, we believe it is counterintuitive for the Scottish Government then uh, to want to discriminate against English, Welsh and Northern Irish students if Scotland was to become independent. Not only is the white paper policy of charging students from the rest of the UK tuition fees, but not other EU students are legal under EU law. The reality of independence is that our higher education funding will be left with a massive black hole of at least £150 million as a result of this. Where is the money going to come to fill that gap? Our ambition is to see an opening, welcome and tolerant Scotland, which does not discriminate on the grounds of nationality. And I noticed in his opening remarks that the Minister uh, did not refer to that part of our amendment. Yeah, certainly give way. Alistair Allen. Giving way again. Uh, the, the member uses the phrase discrimination on grounds of nationality. Well, of course, be aware that both Belgium and Austria uh, have uh, made very similar arguments to those being advanced by the Scottish Government uh, around uh, objective justification for uh, discrimination not on uh, the grounds of nationality but on the grounds of residency when it comes to students from other parts of the EU. Neil Bebe, I can give you around another minute to come to a conclusion. Well, it's, uh, in terms of the arguments around residency, I would refer the member to the recent um, SPICE briefing on um, our UK tuition fees and the University of Scotland legal advice, which uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Education likes to uh, quote, which says that, re that any residency requirement, if objective justification could be uh, argued and, and successfully, which there are very major doubts about, the residence requirement would need to apply to all students, not just those residents in other parts of the UK, essentially meaning what is said in the White Paper is inaccurate. Um, presiding officer, in order to achieve our ambitions for higher education, we must face up to the challenges that currently exist 
within the sector. We have the worst uh, dropout rate, the worst retention rate and damningly low levels of student support. Scottish students uh, are being let down by the Scottish uh, Government. Whilst recognising the issue of student visas needs to be addressed by the UK Government, I would urge the Scottish Government to address the important issues it is responsible for in higher and further education. Presiding officer, uh, in closing, we want to have a system of higher education and further education in Scotland which is outward-looking and meets the needs of our students. We recognise the difficulties faced by our universities across the UK as a result of the coalition government's policy, but we also know that something can be done about it here and now. The stakes for higher education institutions, you their really staff and their students are high. We hope that the UK government and Scottish governments will work together, as Labour did in government, to address the issues our students face. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 10147.1, around six minutes. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in my own name. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister uh, for bringing this uh, debate to Parliament. I think it's important to debate this topic. Uh, and it is a controversial one. Uh, and just like yesterday's uh, debate that we had in the Chamber on childcare, I think it's very important to debate it in the context of what is uh, right for our higher education institutions rather than just in the context of the referendum debate. Notwithstanding the past and current ability of the sector to attract international students in what is an increasingly competitive international market, one cannot fail to listen to the warnings from university principals and University Scotland and indeed Universities UK who have deep-seated concerns about some aspects of current Westminster policy which they see as unnecessarily restrictive. And if the Cabinet Secretary uh, was here, he would know that from two public debates that we've had on this issue in recent times, one I think was on the BBC and the other one in Dundee University in the presence of Peter Downes, uh, I agree with some of these concerns. And I made these plain to David Willits and to Theresa May on separate occasions back in 2012. In particular, I think our universities are absolutely right to be concerned about the lack of flexibility within the timescales uh, for the award of visas and, just as importantly, the lack of transparency when it comes to visa refusals, most especially for our PhD uh, research staff contracts which run beyond an 18-month period. Indeed, I think it is these two issues which have been so central to the concerns of many of the universities in Scotland since they leave doubt in the minds of students and staff about post-study work arrangements and they can hinder future planning and investment. I heard these concerns for myself probably most forcibly in the Aberdeen Medical School and they've also featured at cross-party groups on colleges and universities in this parliament. So there is a real issue and I hope that it is not too late for the Home Secretary to pay attention to the extent of the concern included that raised within six Westminster committees that international students should not be included in the UK government's net migration targets. Because it's simply not acceptable that restrictions mean that uh, our post-study work, or what's called uh, Tier 1 arrangements, uh, is not on the same competitive uh, basis as it is in countries like uh, Canada and Australia uh, and New Zealand. And I personally believe that University of Scotland make a very strong case for extending the length of time that international graduates are given to get a job, not indefinitely, not, that would uh, not be acceptable, but certainly by at least a year. That said, I think it's very important to set this whole debate in context and dispel just some of the myths that have crept into uh, the debate. And that's not just myths from political parties. I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding uh, about the issue. Neil Bibby is quite right to say uh, that this uh, has its uh, foundation, actually, in a debate uh, about colleges, because uh, the UK uh, government, the coalition government, took action because the number of bogus students who were entering further in higher education uh, created very considerable uh, difficulties. And it wasn't just a case of the actual students. There were, as we all know, some bogus uh, colleges as well. So for me, immigration policy needs to be balanced. It needs to be wholly welcoming to those who can make a substantial economic, social and cultural contribution to their institutions, just as the minister has outlined, and to their wider community. But it should be punitive towards those who, who merely uh, wish to take advantage of it for their own ends. And there is no question uh, that four or five years ago that was the case. And if last week's European elections tell us anything, uh, it has uh, demonstrated how careful politi politicians have to be when it comes to handling the whole issue of immigration and the rhetoric uh, which accompanies it. 
Of course. Minister. I really uh, welcome. I thank the member for giving way and I welcome uh, thus far her, her, her speech and her comments. But actually, it's not that very point that is fundamental, where uh, you have to challenge the negative rhetoric that often comes with immigration, a very sensitive issue. And actually, we saw that in the European elections that she talks about. Uh, up here in Scotland, this government has been unashamed in challenging that rhetoric. And therefore, we won the European elections with UKIP in fourth place. Uh, other parties have pandered to that and substantially got beat in the European elections. Does she not think it's time to challenge it as opposed to conform to that rhetoric? No, 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 no. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really accept that particular analysis. Where, where I would agree with the Minister, uh, if we, indeed it is untrue, but I, I think where I do agree with the Minister is I think we have to be very sensitive uh, about the issue of immigration and the rhetoric that has gone with it. And what, I, what I'm pointing out uh, in terms of the actual policy development is the reason that the Westminster government has had to take very significant uh, cuts and changes on the uh, migration issue is because of the extent of the uh, influx, and it was an influx between 2008-9, of bogus students. That, that's the central issue here. That's why this policy was put in place. And that, that's not acceptable to any of our institutions. I don't believe that's acceptable to any of, any of our political parties. Um, but you, it's not good for our higher and further education institutions if these uh, uh, bogus students are able to take advantage of it, because that is a, you know, a disadvantage to those who are able uh, to do that. Presiding officer, uh, in, in the uh, last minute that I have, uh, could I just say that very clearly, I think the Fresh Talent Initiative uh, is a very important one. That was a Scottish uh, innovation. Uh, it is something that I believe uh, ought to come down, uh, ought to come back. I think the uh, doctorate extension uh, scheme, which has now been brought in, is a good thing. And I think the entrepreneur, the graduate entrepreneur route into PhD uh, thresholds is something uh, that ought to uh, come back. But let's be absolutely clear about this. The problems that we have must be set in context. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to end up in very considerable difficulty. And it is not, I don't think, helpful to say that everything about the immigration policy and everything else about coalition government politics is bad for our universities. That is completely untrue. So I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move amendment 10147.2. Around six minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, can I uh, thank the Minister for bringing this debate to Parliament and let me start, as others have done, uh, by acknowledging the impressive track record our universities have when it comes to attracting uh, students from all over the world. In what is by any measure a highly competitive environment, this record of success is no coincidence and does reflect the high quality of the learning, the research and the overall student experience for which our universities are rightly renowned. In return, as University of Scotland remind us in their briefing, these international students contribute an estimated £800 million in fees and wider expenditure within our economy. More than that, they provide a cultural and social infusion to our universities that undoubtedly broadens, deepens and enriches the learning experience for Scots domicile students. So this issue matters, and it matters that we find ways that enable our universities to deliver greater success in future against this backdrop of increased competition from a host of other countries. On this, there will be unanimity across the Chamber, and I can assure uh, the Minister that, like Liz Smith in what I thought was an excellent uh, contribution, he will find no disagreement from me that aspects of current UK immigration policy and the way in which the debate around immigration is framed at times are acting as an obstacle to achieving this objective. My amendment quotes my colleague, the Business Secretary, Vince Cable, who has been particularly critical, as have I, about the inclusion of students in the net migration figures. Given the wider policy in terms of net migration, this has the potential to send both conflicting signals and inhibits the development of sensible policy on higher education. But we should also be clear, and here I think the Minister and the Education Secretary need to be, take care that they are not part of the problem. There is no cap on genuine students coming to Scotland or the rest of the UK from out with the European Union. None at all. So when Universities of Scotland talk about the risks associated with, quote, the perception of UK government policy, this should, I think, give Mr Russell and Mr Youssef pause for thought that in their eagerness to demonise all things UK, they could be accused of contributing to those very same risks. By way of example, Mr Russell's... In a, in a second, uh, uh, Minister, 
By way of example, Mr Russell's assertions at the Education Committee recently that international student numbers at Scottish universities have gone down since visa rules changed back in 2010 were wrong. The numbers have gone up, albeit not as much as one would have hoped, and with a worrying drop, as the Minister rightly pointed out, from key countries such as Pakistan and India. But it is an illustration of the dangers of Mr Russell's approach, as well as further evidence of a somewhat cavalier attitude uh, when it comes to knowing whether figures are actually going up or down. And I give way to the Minister. Minister. I mean, uh, I, re I regret what the, the member has to say. I mean, when I, when I was in, in India uh, and questioned on this, I actually put right some of the misconceptions, and you can read that in the Times of India and indeed some of the interviews that are still there. Uh, but does he not agree with Professor Anton Muscatelli? Not us, but he says the UK government is trying its best to destroy a global brand. There might not be quotas for overseas students, uh, but the impact of the government's, the UK government's anti immigration rhetoric has had the same effect. Does he disagree then with Anton Muscatelli? Liam MacArthur. Well, I've just set out the evidence of that to, to, to the contrary. So to an extent, while I, I understand the concerns of Anton Muscatelli and others in the sector, uh, I think we need to be careful with the language uh, that, we, that we, uh, we use. That said, I agree that changes to policy, presentation and perception are in the interest of higher education across the UK, including here in Scotland. This is also reflected in Liz Smith's amendment, not least in relation to the need for greater flexibility in the student visa system. Liberal Democrats helped secure improvements just over a year ago, enabling an extension to post-study work, yet we do need to go further, recognising that countries such as Australia, the US and Canada have upped their offer in increasing their attractiveness to international students as a result. So I'll continue to argue the case for change, change that enjoys cross-party support, as University Scotland acknowledge. Where the consensus falls apart, as ever, is over the nationalist insistence that only by breaking up the UK can this situation be improved. This is not only untrue, it actually offers a potentially toxic remedy, as Neil Bibby's amendment rightly identifies. For example, leaving the UK would put at risk our ability to access critical research funding. Scottish universities currently punch well above their weight in the context of UK research council allocations, as well as funding from major UK charities. The Council's Professor Boyle has told this Parliament that there is no international precedent for this scale of research collaboration across borders. And while no one is questioning that Scottish universities not the moment, Minister. And while no one is questioning that Scottish universities currently attract a proportionately higher share of funding based on the excellence of their research, it's naive to pretend that these arrangements would simply continue unaffected were Scotland to leave the UK. Indeed, I suspect the SNP know this. Why else would they feel the need to misrepresent the views of Professor Boyle as they have? Restricting the access of our universities to the vast network of UK and I'll give it to you. Minister. He says misrepresenting. I mean, the quote is pretty clear. I don't know if the member uh, has had a chance to see it uh, or not see it, but it's, it's, it's a pretty clear quote, uh, if I can find it. Uh, the quote here uh, <laughs> from Professor Boyle says, we strongly support Scotland retaining its position in a single research ecosystem. We would like to see a single research system continue, whether there is a yes vote for independence or not. In which way is that possibly... Uh, Liam MacArthur, and I will give I, you time back. Thank you very much. I, and I am sure, I'm sure he would, as indeed would we all. But I think what he also goes on to say is there is no international precedent uh, for it, and therefore it is naive to simply assume it would take place. Restricting access of our universities to the vast network of UK embassies, consulates and overseas trade support would also do nothing to enhance the ability of our HE sector to compete for students in this highly competitive environment. As for nationalist claims that students from elsewhere in the UK would continue to be charged tuition fees for studying in Scotland, the Commission has made quite clear such discrimination would be illegal under EU law, saddling Scottish ministers with a bill of around £150 million. There is even evidence that the appeal of our universities to international students could be di diminished by our not being part of this union. Roderick Campbell last week raised concerns highlighted in a recent survey of international students about independence, but Mr Russell chose to entirely ignore this question, presumably on the basis that such impertinence from government backbenchers is not worthy of a response. Of course, the answer that Mr Campbell should have received is that the concerns he raised are valid and underscore the importance of retaining what the authors of the survey called Brand UK. I'm afraid I won't. That said, as I have already accepted, this is not an argument for the status quo. We need a change in the rhetoric and a more consistently positive, welcoming message. And in that context, I agree with the University of Scotland that the Prime Minister's statements in India were helpful. More of that is needed. In terms of policy, while stability is desirable, again, we need to see further movement. Students should be taken out of the net migration figures and improvements to post-study work opportunities provided. The previous Fresh Talent Initiative shows what can be done, and we could do worse than look at that 
uh, model once again. So, presiding officer, in conclusion, I recognise the economic, social and cultural benefits we gain from our universities being able to attract large numbers of international students. Likewise, I understand and accept the, the sector's concerns about the, how their efforts to do more in this area are being constrained, and I will continue to do what I can on a cross-party basis to help deliver the changes we need to see. But the SNP need to accept that independence is not the answer to every question or the solution to every problem. Indeed, in this case, the medicine the SNP is presiding is simply a poison pill, and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. We turn to the open debate speeches of up to six minutes, please. Jim Eady to be followed by Jane Baxter. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate, which is an opportunity to recognise the vital contribution which international students make to higher education, research excellence, the wider economy and the cultural diversity of Scotland. Scottish universities have an excellent track record of attracting international students and have a teaching and research offer which allows them to compete successfully in a fiercely competitive global recruitment environment. Scotland derives huge social, economic and cultural benefit from the 28,500 international students that study in our 19 universities and higher education institutions. The economic impact of international students to Scotland is estimated by Universities Scotland at £337 million every year in fees and an estimated £441 million a year in off-campus expenditure. And as the MSP for Edinburgh Southern, I am incredibly privileged to represent not one but two of Edinburgh's world-class universities, the University of Edinburgh and Edinburgh Napier University, both of whom have campuses within my constituency. And over 30% of Edinburgh Napier's student population are international, and the University of Edinburgh has perhaps the largest total cohort of international students in Scotland. According to their most recent annual review of 2012-13, 12% of their students are EU domiciled, excluding the UK, and 27% are internationally domiciled, excluding the EU. And one of the strengths of the higher education sector in Scotland, which contributes to Scotland having some of the world's top-ranking universities, is its ability to attract and retain some of the finest academics and researchers from across the world. Scotland performs very well in foreign direct investment, leading the way in the UK on projects and jobs created outside of London. And our universities are amongst the key pool factors that contribute to Scotland's attractiveness to investors with their key outputs of skills and research, cited by almost half of all companies as a key reason for their investment in Scotland. And as the MSP for two universities, I wish to highlight the issue of UK immigration policy and its effect on higher education in Scotland. The university sector in Scotland speaks with one clear voice that the UK's regressive policy on student immigration and its obsession with lowering immigration from outside the EU presents a real and immediate threat to the entire higher education sector in Scotland. And I think it's encouraging that on that point there appears to be a consensus uh, across the chamber this afternoon. And this point was made forcefully by University of Scotland, which has stated, and I quote, the UK's visa regime is now significantly more restrictive than that applied by a range of competitor nations who are vigorously seeking to attract talented learners from around the world. This places the UK, including Scotland, at a competitive disadvantage. And key competitors such as the United States, Canada and Australia have continued to expand their international student numbers, as Liam MacArthur acknowledged. Between 2011-12 and 2012-13, international student numbers in three other key English-speaking university markets increased, with 0.4% growth in Australia, 7% growth in the United States and 11% in Canada. And the fact is that the number of first-year students studying at Scottish universities has fallen significantly. According to the UK Higher Education Statistics Authority, applications, as the Minister said earlier, uh, from India fell by 58%, from Pakistan by 38%, and from Nigeria by 22%. And this fall in admissions from some of the most important emerging economies from around the world not only places a stranglehold on a valuable revenue stream for Scottish universities, but also threatens to damage Scotland's well-deserved and hard-earned international reputation. 
It is ironic that a recent survey of Universities UK of international student recruitment offices and higher education institutions across the UK found that only 30% of Scottish institutions were meeting their own targets for international student recruitment. This demonstrates that there is the capacity within institutions to recruit higher numbers of international students, but this ambition is not supported by the current policy environment. Now, the Scottish Government's white paper pledges to take a different approach uh, to immigration from that of the Westminster Government. The Scottish Government quite rightly sees immigration as an aid to healthy population growth in Scotland. Unlike those on the far right of politics, I do not believe that Scotland is full and our immigration policy and our attitude towards international students should reflect our values as a welcoming and inclusive modern country. And reflecting on the UK's policy of curbing the entry of international students, Professor Anton Muscatelli, Principal of Glasgow University, stated that the policy was a message that says, don't come here, we are closed for business, closed for education. It's exactly the opposite message that a number of other countries are sending, including the US, Canada and Australia. I don't think we should be there as a country. Presiding officer, given the positive benefits to Scotland's economy, culture and society, the impact our universities make across the world and Scotland's reputation as a country that welcomes those from overseas with open minds and open arms, I cannot but agree wholeheartedly with Professor Muscatelli. Thank you very much. I now call Jane Baxter to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Scottish Government for bringing forward this debate. It is an issue that is rightly at the forefront of minds across this chamber. I would also like to make the Minister aware that, like my Labour colleagues, I do have a degree, um, but I gave my degree as a mum who was working full time at the time. I went to Napier College, which became a university whilst I was there. So I'm very grateful for the opportunities I got at that college and probably wouldn't be here today had I not got that chance in life and that chance to work really hard. So in that sense, it makes me even more disappointed that only higher education is mentioned in the motion. I think it flags up a little bit of the SNP's attitude towards Scotland's colleges, an attitude that has delivered unprecedented cuts in college budgets and therefore opportunities for people like me for progression, especially for those returning to the workforce, upskilling or from traditionally marginalised groups. And as my colleague Neil Bibby has outlined, the current decisions made by governments in both Holyrood and Westminster have resulted in drastically fewer foreign students attending our colleges, a numerical and financial impact much greater, actually, than on our elite universities. With that caveat, that I think we should be talking about much more than just higher education in this debate, I'd like to speak to several interrelated points in the rest of my time. The first is that I share the government's concerns about the impact of the current Conservative immigration policy. In particular, I have concerns about including students with the, within the blanket immigration cap. This policy treats all legal immigration in the same way as something bad for Britain that should be reduced, and that is wrong. I and the Labour Party strongly believe that it is deeply damaging to the UK's diversity and economy that the number of fee-paying overseas students has fallen at a time when the international market of universities in com comparable countries is growing. That is why university students should be removed entirely from the net migration target. Secondly, however, I would like to move on to emphasise that, as always, changing the constitution is not the way to solve these problems. In this area, to achieve social justice, erecting a border is not the place to start or end. The solution is to elect a government for the whole of the UK that is committed to exempting university students from any net migration target creating a managed system that is in Britain's interests, and it just so happens that we've got a political party which can do that in 2015. We don't need independence to implement positive policies that make allowances for Scotland's differences, while still allowing us to be part of a strong partnership in research and teaching. In the past, we've created schemes in which we cooperate rather than simply take pointed stances against the UK Government. Indeed, it's in the Government's motion today that a post-work study visa scheme is needed to meet Scotland's educational, social and economic ambitions. And I couldn't agree more that such a programme can work. But where I differ with the Government is that I know such a system can work under devolution. We saw such a system implemented in Scotland, Fresh Talent, in 2005, following the exact kind of cooperation between UK and Scottish governments that I've been talking about. This scheme was continued through to 2008, when it became such a success, it was rolled out across the entire UK, but sadly, it was withdrawn by the Conservatives in 2012. 
When we do have governments willing to engage each other and cooperate, then we can ensure, Order, please. as we emphasised in our devolution commission, that we properly account for distinct Scottish needs. In other countries, too, we see allowances being made for the different needs of areas, including systems in Australia and Canada. In our devolution commission report, we identified that there are some barriers to setting up schemes like these, but that we ultimately believe that reasoned and agreed variations between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom are justifiable and workable. Fresh talent has shown us a way forward through cooperation. It's up to the Scottish Government to show they are willing to agree. The third point I'd like to make is one that I think the SNP should reflect on, as it's crucial to their proposed immigration and higher education policy. Whilst all of the discussion today has focused on international migration, the Scottish Government's proposals on the international and EU fee situation post-independence has in particular been doubted by many. I find it shocking that a government that paints itself as open and egalitarian, wishing to cooperate with the rest of the UK post-separation, post is happy to discriminate against those from one specific other state. Our nation's most respected academics, including the chair of European Union Law at Edinburgh University, have lined up to criticise the White Paper's failure to unpick the layered system of derogation and justification. The legal test is not simply an attempt to show objective justification that some SNP members would have us believe. Rather, the newly independent government would have to show that their policy is not directly discriminatory. Direct discrimination simply cannot be justified by any objective justification. It is a much narrower set of derogations that are allowed. The Scottish Government hasn't even attempted to engage in what derogations it may seek following independence, and because the residence requirements outlined only target those from England, Wales and Northern Ireland, it seems that even the objective justifications that Mr Russell has outlined in the past rest on a sugarly peg. Uh -huh. The European Court has only once accepted, in Bressel and others, that a member state can limit access to university courses, and even then, this was in the specific circumstances related to public health, not cost grounds. The prospect of a blanket treatment on residents of one single member state being found proportionate are frankly a little far-fetched, and it's unfair not to face up to this major challenge prior to September. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call George Adam to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome today's debate and I always welcome the fact that the Scottish, to debate the Scottish Government's record in higher education and the valued contribution of international students. I'll incidentally say at this stage, uh, President Officer, I don't have a degree, but I still value what it can give to uh, our community because in Scotland's towns and cities uh, throughout the, the country, the international students are making that difference, not just economically, but also as part of our society. And one of the things, you know, I always get a difficult time in here because people say I always talk as if all roads lead to Paisley. But it's what I know and it's uh, what I've experienced over the years. And UWS in Paisley obviously do well when it comes to international students. We've managed to retain quite a few of the students over the years as well. And also from the point of view that we've even in Renfrewshire Council every single year, they have a get together, a Cayley, a welcome to the town sponsored by Renfrewshire Council in order to actually try and encourage them to enjoy the town. Most of the time these uh, events are actually alcohol free, which is something we could all possibly learn ourselves when you see how much they enjoy the actual event as well as they get involved in Scotland's culture. But they come over here because of our establishments, because of the experience that they can actually get from that. And uh, one of the things is what I mentioned earlier on is, you know, what, what do they actually re re give to Scotland? Well, around £441 million off-campus expenditure. In my own constituency, the university makes a massive contribution to the town in itself because we now have moved. There was a situation where a couple of years ago the, the, the students and international students were outside, the, in the, outside of the town. Now they've got a campus in the centre of town where they can stay as well. And that's made a difference. That was designed in order to make sure that we could get people to actually stay within the town. And I think that's an important part when you're encouraging students from abroad as well as the fact that you're welcoming, they want to be part of your community as well. So not only are they a part of our community, I, I would just like to mention some of the things that have been said during this debate here. Like the Fresh Talent Initiative, you know, the SNP were extremely supportive when the, for, uh, the, the previous uh, Scottish executive put that forward and thought it was way forward. It was adopted by the, the Westminster government as adapted slightly, some would say watered down, but it was adapted by the Westminster government. But then the problem is, the situation is, 
it was taken away by another Westminster government. Now, I said this yesterday, but we constantly hear this argument in Scotland as one more push for a Labour administration and will make all things different. Now, Labour members in here accuse us of saying that independence will be the answer to everything. Well, I'm accusing them of saying another Labour government will make everything better. And they all, it doesn't happen. It clearly does not happen. Every single time they've had opportunities, it ends up with the same Westminster compass going back and forward between the big two parties. So our ideals, our belief is to actually try and make things different. Take that great talent. Take these abilities of these students that are coming from all over the world, saying that Scotland wants, Scotland is open for business, and we want to actually be part of the global economic world. You know, one of the things that uh, was said by uh, during the evidence that we received in the Education Committee was that most of the academics said that, you know, the academic world sees no boundaries. They actually work with each other all the time. And with this, it's very important when you talk about research and uh, the fact that uh, Professor Peter Boyle, who actually said, I was there, he did say that we strongly support Scotland retaining its position in a single research ecosystem. We would like to see a single research system continue, whether there is a yes vote for independence or not. Because that makes sense, because that's been sensible, because our excellence in our universities for research does not, bec not become non-excellent, if I use a Bill and Ted uh, almost uh, reference there overnight, we will still retain that level of excellence. No one will stop coming to your door to actually ask you to be involved in the research. It's quite obvious, it's quite simple, but again, it's and I'm saying this lightly because I think we can all find some form of way of working together in all this, it's uh, just another more of the scare tactics and the negativity. We are saying that the opportunity for us to be able to actually be part of the world, move things forward, is if we have independence and we can take full control of this. Yes, Will. Liz Smith. I thank the member for taking the intervention. There are no scare tactics. Re re no. no, I'm sorry, there are no scare tactics. What Order, please. What I'm asking is... How would the subscription system of academic research in an independent Scotland exceed that of the research that you would get under the current system? George Adam. Negotiations are negotiations and things would actually be sorted out during that period because having been in a, a position in a, in a former life where negotiation was quite an important part of it, I'm pretty sure that things could be sorted out eventually. But what I want to say here is that, you know, when some of the members say about discriminate against UK students when we talk about the objective justification, it's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense because, as certain members were told quite bluntly at the Education Committee, it's about residency. It's about residency. It's not about actually saying that there's any discrimination. Well, yes, this should be fun, Mr Bibby. Can you confirm your policy? Neil Bibby. If it's not about discriminating the grounds of nationality, it's about discriminating the grounds of residency. George Adam. Briefly. No. An objective justification is exactly what the argument is. You know, I think uh, Mr Bibby makes a demolishment of his own argument when he talks about these things here. You know, because at the end of the day, we have to look at this situation. So what I'm saying, presiding officer, is we have to look at a mature way of taking this forward. The only way I see it is for Scotland to be independent, take the full controls. I don't believe this non-stop Labour Tory nonsense down south is going to do us any better anywhere else. Thanks. Um, I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The topic of immigration has preoccupied most of the UK during the EU elections. With the wall-to-wall -wall media coverage of UKIP, we in Scotland have also been subjected to a tirade of one-subject campaigning. All of it completely distorts the reality here. Only since 2003 have the number of people coming to Scotland consistently exceeded the number of those leaving. It will take us quite a while to make up the deficit, nor has the natural population growth helped to make up for the loss of people to emigration. England's position, interestingly, is diam diametrically opposed. While we added an average of just 2,667 people a year during the last three decades, net migration into mostly England was 2.8%. 92 million in just one decade between 2001 and 2011. We need people, especially young people, to come here and make a positive contribution to our culture, 
our economy and our communities. Without immigration, we are going to find it hard, if not impossible, to sustain a workforce large enough to help pay the pensions of those retiring, and maybe some of us a bit closer to that than others. But Westminster seems utterly determined to restrict the number of people coming to the UK in any way it can. The UK has dumped, as we have heard, Tier 1 post-study work visas, replacing them with graduate entrepreneur visas capped at 1,000 students and making it increasingly difficult for non-EU citizens wishing to work here. And rather than offer these students, many of them taking courses in modern business methods, including MBAs, an easy opportunity to start their careers in Scotland, we are sending them straight back into the arms of our competitors abroad. It is a crazy policy and one driven by a perceived problem which does not even apply in Scotland. But of course, as we know, immigration policy is a reserved matter. And if the Home Office wants to festoon Scottish buses or visa offices with go-home advertisements, there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. And if any Westminster Government wants to take any policy it's implemented at any time, they can just take it back. They can just stop it. And that's the point here. And that's the point of this whole debate. We can only develop new and appropriately designed policies with the leverage that independence will give us. Because without that independence, we can't stop the Tory Westminster government from taking away the Fresh Talent Initiative. We can't stop them for capping student visas. We can't stop any of that. This is yet another example of a big and crucial example of how we are definitely not better together. At an economic level, there is established evidence from the IFS board report, which is in Chapter 4, that a Scottish migration system can improve our fiscal balance by some £1.6 billion a year. Just last month, we heard from the principal of the University of Glasgow. We've heard a lot about him today. He criticised Westminster's approach to migration legislation, saying that the university's links across the world were under threat. You begin to see, and I quote, you begin to see how people have perceived what the UK has been doing in immigration, the immigration space so negatively. He said that it's like putting up a closed for business or closed for education, don't come here sign. Now, that's strong words and powerful words from the principal of Glasgow University, a long and millennia, <laughs> centuries long, sorry, tradition of providing education. We already know that in Scotland we do punch well above our weight in terms of equality and ambition of our further and higher education institutions. And I can make the point on research grants. Research grants are best based on merit, not geography. So can we just get rid of that red herring here and now? Scotland has been an educational leader since the early part of the 15th century. It is home to some of the world's oldest and most prestigious universities as well as some of the finest specialist vocational and modern institutions. Graduates of working age, highly educated and likely to be keenly ambitious. That means they will generate more taxes. That means they will settle in this country. That means they will have their children in this country. That means they will contribute greatly in many ways, not just financially, to this country. Scotland attracts over 40,000 students a year from across the world. These students are net contributors to the economy during their studies. Some £779 million annually, but most are compelled to return home once they graduate because of a daft, short-sighted policy that does not then use the brains that these young people have. And in independent Scotland, we could create incentives that would encourage these young people to establish themselves in Scotland. As a nation, we would benefit not only economically, but across the cultural and social spectrum of having an international mix of identities. Westminster is damaging our economy. Both University Scotland and the University College Union Scotland have criticised the draconian approach to immigration and student visas. It makes no sense to train experienced, gifted graduates in Scotland only to force them to leave as soon as they are qualified. And one thing that I have to finish with, presiding officers, the can't-do attitude of the Better Together parties here today epitomises the very reason we need our independence to, to maintain that Scotland, that can-do attitude that Scotland has. Thanks. Thank you.
I now call on Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Hanzala Malik. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today's debate on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland is, I believe, a very timely one. In recent years, we have seen the UK Government's approach to immigration policy become illogical and damaging to different aspects of society, particularly to our higher education sector. In a bid to appease the Tory rebels on their back benches and in a vain hope of scuttling the rise of UKIP in England, David Cameron and Theresa May have pursued a politically motivated immigration policy rather than one that is functional and addresses the needs of the constituent parts of the UK. This immigration policy has manifested itself in the desire to cut overall migrant numbers. The ability to cut migrant numbers, regardless of the impact on business or education, is now the self-defined measure of success for the UK's government's immigration policy. To meet these targets, the UK government knows it cannot cut numbers from the EU, so it's imposing increasingly strict immigration criteria on non-EU citizens who wish to come here, including many of the students who would like to study at Scotland's world-leading universities and colleges. The decision to impose further restrictions on non-EU migrants as a perceived solution to EU migration epitomises the UK Government's increasingly nonsensical and dysfunctional approach to immigration policy. As a result, the number of students from India to Scotland has fallen by 58%, while the number of students moving from India to Australia has increased by 70%. Other English-speaking countries like the United States and Canada have also enjoyed healthy increases in international student numbers. Scotland, on the other hand, is now lagging behind the non-EU student numbers decreasing. The impact of the UK Government's policies have not gone unnoticed. Indeed, they have been doggedly pursued in spite of the criticism of industry specialists. In 2013, the High Court ruled that UK visa rules were unjustified and disproportionate, infringing on both the rights of British citizens and those wishing to come here. In recent evidence to the European and External Affairs Committee, Professor Wright of Strathclyde University called the current UK Government policies on international students a disaster, which made us less competitive. The Principal of the University of Glasgow, Professor Anton Muscatelli, is of a similar view, stating that UK Government immigration rules are damaging to the higher education sector in Scotland and create an international perception that students are not welcome here. The UK Government bluntly reinforced this point with their high-profile Go Home poster campaign, which was subsequently withdrawn after the Advertising Standards Agency ruled that the campaign was predicated on misleading and inaccurate st statistics. Professor Muscatelli continued by saying that the message that we were closed for education was, and I quote, exactly the opposite message that a number of other countries are sending, including the US, Canada and Australia. I don't think we should be there as a country. Yet ultimately, Scotland has no say over this matter. Scotland attracts 40,000 students from 180 countries every year, students who contribute more than £779 million to the economy annually. However, the benefits of international students are not simply quantifiable in monetary terms. Foreign students develop an international outlook amongst their own homegrown students and enrich the learning experience for everyone in the education sector. NUS Scotland's evidence to the Education and Culture Committee succinctly stated the case by saying that immigration, including for the purposes of study, provide huge benefits to Scotland and the UK and should be wholly encouraged. It is therefore difficult to understand why we should allow the benefits of migration to be threatened by the politically motivated immigration policy being imposed by Westminster. Scotland can, should and must choose a different path, and a yes vote in September will ensure we have a sensible, measured and proportionate immigration policy as outlined in the Scottish Government's White Paper on Independence. Studies undertaken by the Migration Observatory at Oxford University found that a majority of people would prefer immigration decisions to be taken by Holyrood rather than at Westminster. The study also found that there was public sympathy for the Scottish Government's position of encouraging international students to study here. Now, one measure that we could immediately reintroduce with independence is the post-study work visa. The UK Government made a short-sighted decision in withdrawing the scheme which allowed many highly skilled and educated migrants to remain in Scotland. It makes little sense to train graduates only to then tell them to leave the country. Now, I'm delighted there seems to be a universal agreement in this chamber that we should introduce a post-study visa. The problem with the opposition's argument is that what the UK Government giveth, the UK Government then taketh away. That is the problem. Well, there's universal agreement here. We can do nothing about it while the powers rest with Westminster. 
The reintroduction of the post-study work visa will help to attract international students to our universities and colleges and to deliver the economic prosperity that could be achieved with independence. Independence will also give us the full range of powers to incentivise innovation and to encourage research investment in our universities. It will, allow us, uh, sorry, it will allow our higher education sector to compete effectively for the best international students and to create a country that is welcoming and open to international researchers. It is clear that there is little hope of reform while Scotland is part of the UK. Our colleges and universities can only watch powerlessly as events in the south of England negatively impact upon the future prospects of the education sector in Scotland. Scotland would be better served by an immigration policy tailored to suit Scotland's specific circumstances, rather than the one-size-fits-all approach taken by Westminster. Scotland's needs are different from those of the south of England, and independence will allow us to create an immigration system that is fair, proportionate and works in conjunction with the higher education system rather than against it. Presiding officer, it is important for international students to know that Scotland is open for business, that they are a welcome addition to our society, and that the negative and damaging voice of Westminster does not reflect the views commonly held here in Scotland. Many thanks. Now call on Hans Malik to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you very much and good afternoon, presiding officer. It is an honour to speak about the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland. Scotland is historically known to produce skillful and original individuals. Furthermore, Scotland is rightfully proud of its historic excellent education system and our universities are amongst the best in the world. Over the last decade, Scottish universities have excelled an increase in a number of Scottish, European, Union and international students. Currently, figures indicate that Scotland has a higher share of students attending from a higher education who come from countries out with the UK than the UK as a whole. That speaks volumes for our education system and it also gives me an opportunity to thank all the teachers lecturers and professors in Scotland for the dedication, the hard work they do for our students and students from overseas. But the basic fact is that Scottish undergraduate degrees take a year longer than in England and Wales. You cannot tell me that students having to pay an additional year, year's worth of fees and living costs to study in Scotland has no influence on the decision to study here. Another point is that excellent international reputation of the British high, higher education system as a, as a whole benefits us. A survey carried out by Chinese students at four of Scottish universities found that 200 overseas students surveyed from, had 46% of nationals said that they would be less likely to choose a university in an independent Scotland because they wanted a British degree. Now that survey actually surprised me myself. More than a third feared that the repetition of a Scottish degree would be not be considered as valuable as a British degree. That, I suppose, needs to be put to the test. However, nevertheless, there is a perception that a British degree would be more valuable. Many students automatically begin their search for a course by contacting a British council or an embassy. They look through all the British universities and apply for a course that meets their needs. Scottish education institutions are able to make themselves identifiable and take part in that British system. The Scottish the, if, Scot if Scotland leaves the UK, then it is no longer have the benefit of the experience and the network of embassies and councils in 170 countries around the world. Yes, I will. Well, while the member makes many very, while the member makes many very good points, I, I struggle to understand some of the arguments he's most recently been making. Um, if it is the case that only a British degree holds attractions, why is it that despite the what, why, well, primarily holds attractions in, in, in the view of what you said there. Why is it the case that Canadian uh, universities are having so little difficulty in attracting students from India and other countries? And 
Perhaps is he making a case that, that Canada shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have taken the decisions it did about self-determination? <laughs> well, the member will... Lanzar Malik. The member will uh, appreciate that Canada did have uh, an action to separate, and they didn't. Uh, however, that said, I'll, I'll go on to say that uh, in, in terms of uh, having advantages of so many outlets does give us an advantage. There is absolutely no, no doubt about that. However, I do agree with uh, Hamza Yusuf in terms of difficulties in immigration issues. But I think that the, the cut in marketing costs in India and Pakistan by the Scottish government didn't help because at the end of the day, it's all about marketing. It, it does play a role. We can't pretend that it doesn't have an effect. It does. And it would be unfair and unjust to suggest that it doesn't. We would like to see the Scottish Government also play its own, its own duty by paying Scottish colleges and universities more money so that our own students can have places. Hamza Yusuf and myself have constituents who have received letters from colleges to say they're 600th in a queue for a place. I wonder how long and how old they will be when they get a place eventually. And this is a country where uh, the government is saying it's free education. I don't believe it's free education if you can't get in. And it's the same for universities. There are students who have all the qualifications they can get entry into, but they've been denied a place because the Scottish government has not paid their fee for them. Once again, a promise made by the Scottish government and denied. And, you know, we really need to look at ourselves, first of all, to see whether we're being honest with ourselves rather than be disgenuous with students. I'm sure many of the students who didn't get places this year will think twice about independence because they know that the government that has made promises to them in terms of free education have not delivered on them. Brought your close, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, presiding officer. So, so finally, uh, presiding officer, what I really want to say is I'm really very keen to see the Scottish Government actually deliver on the promises they've made themselves rather than look around who to blame and who to use as a tool, as a political tool, to try and sell the idea of independence because it just isn't true. Thank you. Many thanks. Now I call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin my contribution this afternoon by reminding the Chamber of how successful, how unique and how important Scotland's education is to the collective intellectual, international, world knowledge economy. In October last year, the British Council published a detailed and comprehensive assistant, uh, assessment of Scotland's higher education system and its de de distinctive and defining strengths. It was authored by Neil Kemp and William Lawton. The report finds that overall learning satisfaction of international students in Scotland is unmatched worldwide reflecting the Scottish ethos of a higher education as a public good. The Scottish system is world-class and rated highly, not only against the rest of the UK, but internationally. The report picks out defining characteristics of, that are unique to Scotland. The primacy of the learner and the strength, stress on lifelong learning, an integrated and inclusive sector that is internationally active, a no-fees policy for Scottish and EU undergraduates, high employability rates for graduates, strong links with business and industry, an innovative system of research pooling and research investment, high levels of research impact, including many spin-off companies, success in winning research income, and the strong recruitment of international students. On its publication, Lloyd Anderson of the British Council Scotland said, the report tells a remarkable story of a national academic system that is world-class, highly innovative, a story of which Scotland should be very proud. The nation's assets include a higher than expected number of world-class universities as rated by both academic indicators and the students themselves, and a uniquely joined up, collaborative and inclusive sector. And Professor Nigel Seaton, the Vice Chair of the International Committee at the University of Scotland and Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University of Aberdeen, said, This report confirms the distinctive strengths that put Scottish higher education on the world stage, especially emphasises on our integrated approach to lifelong learning as supported by the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework. In Section 3.11 of the report, um, which looks at non EU international students, 
It highlights some of the successes that Scotland has in this area. It particularly looks to US and Canada as successes, and it also sees other successes uh, uh, have been the increased enrolments from China and India, although the rate from India has um, fallen recently. And recent indicators are that Indian enrolments have been adversely hit by changes to UK immigration policies. Presiding officer, in June 22, 2005, the Fresh Talent Initiative was launched in Scotland. Jack McConnell said a year earlier, I laid a, a challenge down to Scotland, to challenge of growth. I set out the economic and social case for increasing Scotland's population through promoting ourselves within the UK's policy of managed migration. The policy statement describes how Scotland's devolved government will begin to reverse the population decline that threatens our future prosperity through the modern scheme of managed migration. Today in this chamber, Jamie McGregor was asking a question about our girl in Butte, about the demographic challenges and the decrease in population in that area. These problems are well known and well understood within Scotland. And if ever there was an argument for why we need constitutional change, it is this very issue. We had a policy that represented what the needs of Scotland were. We negotiated that policy. It was delivered and it worked for Scotland. Nothing has changed in our challenges. What has changed is in the whim of a Westminster government with political pressures that are not relevant in Scotland, they took away and cancelled that Fresh Talent, challenge, uh, Fresh Talent initiative. There's also been quite a bit of discussion this afternoon about the objective justification within the White Paper, but very little discussion about why that objective justification is there. We must remind ourselves it is there because of the obscenity of charging students up to £9,000 a year south of the border for their education, something that we don't agree with in Scotland and do not want to have to introduce. This is not something that we are, this is something we've been forced into because of the poor decisions about charging for education elsewhere in the UK. And of course, the future is not about the current, no, no, thank you. The future is not about the status quo versus what's in the white paper, because the very likely outcome of the political changes that we're seeing as a result of last week's election is that the EU relationship will be renegotiated and voted on. And we have no, no clear um, future as to how the, the rest of the UK and their relationship of the EU will go forward. So I'm less worried about this than the rest of the, the um, opposition members seem to be. I have many, many quotes here from submissions from Colleges Scotland in the evidence about this issue. And um, I'm, I'm very sorry that I'll not be able to, to have many of them today. But if I could just point to Professor Wright, who's the, um, from the Department of Economics in the University of Strathclyde, where he says that... English-speaking countries, of which there are many, say five or six, the issue is critical for Scotland because higher education sector is a huge yeah. compared to the sector in England and many other countries, and it's very more important to our economy. And he goes on to say he's losing students to Canada because they can't work within the visa system that the UK government has set. Thanks very much. Now call on Roderick Campbell, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Six thank you. minutes, please, or thereby, Mr Campbell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, last Sunday, like countless others, I bought my Sunday paper, which contained an interesting insert from a group called Better Together. It contained the following comment, quote, with more universities in the world's top 200 per head of population than any other country on the planet, Scotland's universities are thriving as part of the UK. Well, I can agree at least that Scotland's universities are thriving, and of course it's absolutely true that Scotland's universities are a vital part of Scotland's economy. Indeed, even the Scottish Affairs Select Committee acknowledged that the excellence of Scotland's higher education institutes meant they attract a disproportionate share of UK research funding, attracting, as others have said, just under 30,000 international students, not including the EU, and 12% of all students are from overseas, not including the EU. Scotland has five of the top 200 universities of the world, including St Andrews, of course, where 2,625 students, or 33% of the total, are from overseas. These universities are global institutions. 
As Alistair Sim of University of Scotland has said, however, the UK offer to overseas students is not as attractive when compared with competitors in Canada, USA and Australia. The absence of post-study work visa, the inability to be accompanied by family members and other issues play their part in the students' consideration of the options. And we know of increasing difficulties students from India and Pakistan have in getting visas at all, cap or no cap. Our loss is, of course, Australia's gain. Easier requirements in Australia has caused a dramatic increase in numbers of students from India and Pakistan, albeit from a low base. The question is, will independence help? Although Jack McConnell's comments that we need to grow the population, to grow the labour force, to grow the economy were made not specifically in connection with independence, the reality is that the UK's current immigration policy impedes uh, uh, entry into Scotland. Even that august unionist body, the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, grudgingly acknowledged that independence may provide scope for, quote, marginal change, which might be beneficial to the recruitment of foreign students. And as Stuart Maxwell has already referred to, what was absolutely clear from the evidence of Professor Robert Wright, the European and External Affairs Committee of this Parliament, is, as he said, that the current UK system is a disaster. With the removal of the Fresh Talent Initiative, foreign students have to leave six months after they graduate and have to be monitored on a monthly basis. That is making us less competitive because our chief competitors do not do that. That's what he said to the committee. He also said he didn't understand why, from a rational economics point of view, the UK has a system that it has and why Scotland is forced to follow it. That has to be true. Above all else, it looks like a political rather than economic decision. The UK government could, of course, change its policy, but given the results last Thursday, perhaps that looks less likely. But even without independence, Professor Wright believes that the Canadian experience shows and the Canadian Quebec Accord suggest that responsibility could be devolved. If our political opponents really believe in the best of both worlds, perhaps they should consider it. Chinese students are the most mobile on the planet, accounting for 16% of all international students, over half a million in total, they are substantial consumers of higher education. Professor Downs told this Parliament's Education and Culture Committee that China is not a country that is subject to intensive scrutiny by the immigration people at Westminster. Uh, my colleague, Liam MacArthur, has already referred to the China Girls Survey. I agree with others that the conclusions are disappointing, but I think at the end of the day, some of those concerns might be misplaced. Can I quote from some of the comments? Student A. After independence, the spending on education might be reduced. Student B wouldn't have opportunities to explore the rest part of UK. Student C, UK is a comparatively developed and well-organised country in education, but if Scotland became independent, it would face many issues such as currency, diplomacy and defence. Echoes of George Osborne, for chat, per chance. And in the conclusion, perhaps the most telling comment of all is the uh, suggestion, if you bear with me one second, whilst I... Uh, Read it. In a sense, the view of the students expressed here and the divisions between them over the future status of Scotland parallel the arguments in Scottish society as a whole. I couldn't agree more, but I think the truth of the matter is a world-class institution will remain a world-class institution wherever in the world it is located. And what's absolutely true is as a society we have to ensure that we are open and welcoming to students. And it's noteworthy that the NUS survey found that 50% of international students feel unwelcome in the UK and that nearly 20% would not recommend the UK to a friend or relative as a place to study. Those are issues that we need to tackle. I accept, of course, that universities exist in a competitive market. Universities need to market themselves under any constitutional arrangement and I'm convinced that Scotland's universities are up to that challenge. In the time remaining, presiding officer, I would just like to say a few words generally about migration. Um, growth in population terms between Scotland and the rest of the UK has been anything but equal uh, over history. As Tom Devine has suggested, between 1841 and 1911, 600,000 Scots moved south without a similar move in the opposite direction. Today, of course, there is a move from south to north, as well as, of course, a substantial migration from Scotland to the south, such that 700,000 Scotlands, Scots or thereabouts born folk live elsewhere in the UK. And when we talk of increasing the working population, I think it's just possible that some of that population of Scots-born folk might want to return to a Scotland, which is at least intent on creating the conditions for a thriving, growing economy, and a Scotland that's keen to attract students and skilled workers from across the world. And it's perhaps telling that the people talking about border controls are Theresa May and rather right-wing conservatives like the absent Alec Johnson, 
Whatever else, presiding officer, their message is not one of hope and aspiration. Thank you. Thank you. We now move the closing speeches, and I call on Liam MacArthur up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Uh, thank MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Officer. I think it's been a, an intriguing debate where um, there has been a large amount uh, of consensus, and perhaps inevitably in the, in the run-up to September, um, the, uh, the, the now all too customary uh, areas of difference. I think um, there is unanimity across the chamber about the contribution that international students make to our universities, both. Uh, economically, but also culturally uh, and socially. I think that was reflected in the speeches made by everyone. Um, George Adam gave a, um, a, a, a perfect illustration of, of this and the impact within his own uh, Paisley constituency. And likewise, I think Jim Eadie, in also pointing to the, the impact of the, the, uh, the, the two universities within his own constituency, was right to remind us then of the, uh, the, the contribution that the universities have in terms of attracting uh, inward investment as well. I think a point that was perhaps not made as forcefully as it should in this uh, contact, uh, context is the contribution that international students make to the soft power um, that uh, Scotland uh, and indeed the UK exerts through graduates from our, our universities. There was unanimity too in terms of recognising and I think accepting the concerns that have been made very, very forcefully uh, by those across our universities uh, sector. I think Liz Smith was right uh, at the outset to helpfully set out some of the background uh, to why the changes in the visa regime uh, were introduced. I think they were accepted by Neil Bibby uh, as part of his remarks as well. They were notably absent, uh, I think, from most of the contributions uh, by those on the government side. But I think it's helpful in terms of setting uh, the context, not just in terms of why we are here, perhaps the issues that need to be resolved in determining how we get from here to uh, where we need to, ensuring our universities uh, are competitive. But there is an acceptance that change, not just in policy, but also in the rhetoric that is used around uh, immigration, is again accepted right across this chamber. But as I say, perhaps predictably, uh, where the consensus breaks down um, ahead of September is over how we go about uh, resolving this. Now, I simply don't accept that the independence is somehow a panacea that can be rolled out uh, when confronted by any uh, and every problem, that it will somehow miraculously change all the things that we want to change, but leave untouched all the aspects that we want uh, to remain uh, the same. I think the debate around uh, immigration is, thankfully, different in Scotland or has been different in Scotland to other parts of, of the country. I was listening with interest to, to Roderick Campbell's uh, uh, comments there about uh, migration within the UK, but I would make uh, the point, and I think Claire Adamson reflected that in her comments referring to Jamie McGregor's question earlier today, there is migration within Scotland that has nothing to do with immigration policy, um, but reflects, um, I think, the, the, the trouble that all governments have in terms of retaining population in, in areas that are perhaps um, slightly remoter. So I think in, in the case of the debate we have around uh, immigration, um, we shouldn't delude ourselves into assuming this would inevitably remain the case were Scottish ministers to become responsible for uh, immigration policy. The, the minister pointed to public uh, poll support uh, for such a move, but the social attitudes surveys and recent polling evidence suggest that public views on immigration do vary very little between north and south of the border. As the Herald revealed only last week, seven out of ten Scots back stricter immigration controls. And again, these f facts cannot simply be glossed over in an attempt to argue that we are by instinct entirely different from those living elsewhere in these islands. This is not an argument for saying that we should pander to these attitudes, quite the reverse, but it should urge caution in the assumptions we're being asked to make by the SNP. So the tone of the debate around immigration needs to improve. In the face of what happened last week, not just here but across the continent, it is all the more important that politicians north and south of the border convey a message that we are open, tolerant and we are welcoming. Policy too needs to reflect on aspirations and again I reiterate and underscore my view that while there is no cap on international student numbers, these should sit apart from overall net migration figures. Increasing the opportunities for the best and the brightest international students to stay on after completing their studies also needs to happen. Improvements have been made, but I strongly believe that there is a case for going further, not least to reflect, as others uh, have observed, the competition our universities now face from counterparts in the US, Canada uh, and Australia in particular. But the, the argument that breaking up the UK is the best way of making our universities more attractive to international students simply doesn't add up to scrutiny. 
As Neil Berry pointed out in his opening remarks, and his leading academics have also made clear, there is a threat to research funding that our universities currently attract. Last week, 14 professors from all five of Scotland's medical schools expressed their, quote, grave concerns about Scotland's research community being, quote, denied its present ability to win proportionately more grant funding than the country contributes to a common research pool. They go on to add, and I quote, we regard creation of a post-independence common research area as an undertaking fraught with difficulty and one that is unlikely to come to fruition. And I'll give way to the Minister. Dr. Alistair. And he knows what I'm going to say, which is that he will be aware that 102 academics wrote uh, into the press uh, shortly following that, pointing out that they felt that independence held out the best prospect for research funding in Scotland. Uh, Ian MacArthur. Well, I think we can, we can weigh up your academics say this and our academics say that, but I don't think you can ignore the fact that these, and as George Adam readily acknowledged, subject to negotiations, simply asserting that this will remain um, the, the case going forward is not at all uh, convincing. It's difficult to see how a situation uh, would be beneficial to improving the attractiveness of our universities to international students. I'm afraid I'm in my last minute, sorry, Claire. Reduced access to the UK network of embassies, consuls and inward investment support also seems to work against the objectives. We're all uh, seeking to make our universities more competitive internationally. I don't doubt that a scaled-back Scottish diplomatic operation would target key markets, but it would inevitably be more stretched and create increased numbers of blind spots. Meanwhile, the claims that um, the nationalists could go on charging fees to students from the rest of the UK in the event of a yes vote is believed by no one but themselves. Academic experts and the Commission have explained how this would be discriminatory and illegal under EU law. In the event that uh, the Education Secretary is wrong, however, Scottish Ministers will need to find an extra £150 million or more to cover the cost of lost fee income. Added to this, as Roderick Campbell uh, has said, a survey of international students at four Scottish universities recently revealed that nearly half of non-EU students said they would be less likely to come here as if Scotland was an independent please. country. As one student put it, the UK is a powerful brand. Presiding officer, our, our international students do indeed enrich our universities while providing a significant contribution to our economy. University of Scotland is right to seek our support in ensuring this vital sector remains competitive and attractive. Thanks and once we're much. beyond September, I hope we will be able to use that consensus to secure that objective. Thank you. And I call on Mary Scanlon. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I, first of all, uh, but not just acknowledge the content of the speeches from both Liam MacArthur and Liz Smith, but, in fact, the tone. And I do think that the tone has been very fitting uh, in such a debate. I don't think they're the only ones, but uh, I, I, I do think it's important that this debate has been conducted in such a manner. Uh, I would also acknowledge the agreement across this chamber. Uh, we may have our differences leading up to September the 18th, but we do all agree on the contribution to Scotland of EU and indeed international students. My own daughter went to Leiden for a year as part of the Erasmus scheme in her degree, and I know how much uh, she benefited from that and from meeting uh, uh, other students there. Presiding officer, like my colleague Liz Smith, I, I welcome the chance to deba debate immigration uh, policy today. And while I completely understand why University of Scotland and individual principals, such as Anton Mus Muscatelli, he's had many mentions today, uh, have raised concerns about the UK government's immigration policy, as the Conservative amendment makes clear, and I think Liz Smith did very well to set out, it is vital to place this in concept or context. Specifically, the previous student visa system had to be looked at. I can do no better than quote the Public Accounts Committee, chaired by the former Labour Minister Margaret Hodge, which concluded that the changes of 2009 were poorly planned and ill thought out, and they were implemented before proper controls were in place. The result? An estimated 40 to 50,000 additional migrants coming to the UK to work rather than study. And a Newsnight investigation, as well as Panorama, of course, and Newsnight were able to obtain two bogus visa documents for £350. And since being elected, the UK coalition government has sought to address this. The measures are too numerous to mention, so I'll just mention uh, two or three. All institutions uh, that want to sponsor students now have to be classed as highly trusted 
and be accredited by statutory education inspection bodies, and rightly so. We owe it to the students coming here. There has been a shift away from paper visa applications, which were being abused, towards online print and send application forms. Credibility interviews have been established, which also assess those who apply to study in the UK. I do appreciate, presiding officer, that there were no bogus colleges in Scotland, but they did undoubtedly exist elsewhere in these islands. So given the huge problems with the old system, the changes were necessary. No one could argue they were not necessary, and I thank Neil Bibby for acknowledging that in his opening remarks. The Vice-Chancellor of the University of East Anglia said the UK Government had listened to their concerns about pathway courses into universities and the need for the language requirement to be set at a realistic level that will not deter good students. Accordingly, for an immigration system to function properly, it must it totally must welcome those who are willing to contribute to society while acting against those who seek to exploit the system. As Liam MacArthur said, a recent poll identified about seven out of ten Scots believe stricter controls are necessary uh, in terms of uh, immigration. So whatever we think about such opinions, we cannot simply wish them away. And leaving aside all the uncertainties which surround the SNP's own immigration proposals, the facts state that the UK government came to power, when they came to power, the number of first-year enrolments, as I think Kezia Dugdale said, from non-EU countries to Scottish universities has actually increased year on year, with students coming here to study, and we all thoroughly welcome their contribution. And while there has been a drop in the number of Indian students coming to Scotland to study, equally, the numbers from China, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Thailand and many others continue to rise year on year. So if we want to talk about India, let's look at that in context as well. So, presiding officer, like others, I say international students make a huge contribution to Scottish life, educationally, economically, and of course culturally. And I also sympathise and I acknowledge the concerns voiced by University of Scotland and by Professor Pete Downes uh, when he recently appeared before the Education uh, Committee. But we want to welcome students, as I've said. We do not want people coming in with bogus visas that are detrimental to those wishing to come and to contribute uh, to Scottish life. We do want to discourage those who exploit and abuse the system. The UK government had to tackle the student visa system that was coming in for abuse, and these measures must be taken in context. So just finally, uh, presiding officer, I do think... <clears throat> Uh, the discrimination against, and it is discrimination, against England stu English students, if we do go forward to an independent Scotland, is unacceptable. And any attempt to maintain good relations with our nearest neighbours, this has to be the worst possible policy. And while Claire Adamson stands on the high moral ground and talks about how she opposes £9,000 tuition fees. <laughs> She's very happy to take the £9,000 tuition fees from those uh, coming from England. You know, so if she's opposed to 9,000 tuition fees, why is she so happy to charge that amount to English students oh if independent Scotland were to come? So I will close there, presiding officer. Thanks very much. Well, we'll now move on to Kezia Dugdale. Up to eight minutes, please.
Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I be the third person to welcome the tone of the debate? And if only the media had taken the same approach, we might have had a different election result last week. Um, Liz Smith was the first to introduce the European election results, and Liam MacArthur mentioned them in his closing too. Uh, and so can I take a moment to say that we should all unite against UKIP, uh, stand up and take them on. The solutions they put forward just don't stack up when you look at the challenges the UK faces. I believe them to be a regressive, a reactionary and a racist force in UK politics. I take some com comfort from the fact that at Edinburgh the UKIP vote was just 7.7%, but it was as high as 13.6% in other parts of the country. And we have a duty to unite and defeat uh, these arguments and that party with the power of our arguments and the will of our work. Moving on to uh, Hamza's opening uh, remarks, I was really pleased that uh, the Minister uh, mentioned the role of the National Union of Students in, and the approach they take to welcoming international students to our shores, not just welcoming them but giving them an active role in um, student participation uh, and in the democratic uh, systems that we have in place in so many of our universities. They lead much of the work uh, around promoting a positive place for international students on our campuses. He did, however, say he would come back to the issue of colleges in his uh, speech and I don't feel like that he did that, so perhaps he'll return to it in his close. Um, he was also very gracious, and I believe, to have uh, mentioned the Fresh Talent Initiative, and I'd like to pay tribute to Jack McConnell's uh, leadership on that particular initiative. Jack's um, most successful policy is often viewed as the, the smoking ban, but actually I think um, when you look behind the scenes you could argue that Fresh Talent Initiative was one of the most innovative and progressive things that Jack McConnell did in the sense that it was a long-term uh, policy that had a great deal of foresight about the population challenges that we face as a country and took them head on, um, much against the, the will of uh, quite a right-wing press, so we should unite and, and recognise that. Of course, at the heart of Jack's, uh, Jack McConnell's Fresh Talent Initiative however, was the fundamental acceptance and belief that you could have UK-wide border controls, but also a flexibility within that system that reflected local and national circumstances. Fresh Talent was combined with a wider programme of promoting Scotland overseas at the time, of course, and the slogan was, now is the time, Scotland is the place. But behind that bold slogan was a serious policy and a mechanism to deliver it. And although we've heard much about the Fresh Talent Initiative, we haven't heard much about the Relocation Advisory Service, which underpinned much of the Fresh Talent work. And can I just take a moment to mention that, President Officer? The Relocation Advisory Service was introduced at the same time as the Fresh Talent Initiative in 2004, and it was funded by the Scottish Government as part of the Fresh Talent Initiative. The Scottish Government continued to fund it when fresh talent was absorbed into the UK Labour Government's plans around Tier 1, tier one post-study visa schemes. And during that period, as I say, the Scottish Government continued to support the, uh, the allocation service because it offered a one-stop shop uh, information advisory service for people looking to study, live and work in Scotland. It also worked with employers to provide advice and assistance when companies were looking to recruit staff from overseas. And people could do that using the website www.scotlandisaplace.com. That website is no longer operational. And in 2012, uh, the Scottish Government restructured and the uh, Relocation Advisory Service was subsumed into Talent Scotland, a uh, Scottish enterprise initiative. And we've had a look at the uh, Talent Scotland website and there's nothing like the same degree of work and information and services that the Relocation Advisory Service offered. I think it's quite important to recognise that in this debate. There was also, of course, the One Scotland Many Cultures campaign, which ran from 2002 to 2008, and it stopped in 2009. I asked Spice about this earlier today. I asked Spice to tell me whether there were any equivalent schemes now, and they told me that there is no current anti-racism media campaign in Scotland, but there, are, there is marketing activity on equality issues planned for later this year. So I just think it's important to recognise these two factors because as much as I agree with much of what uh, Hamza Youssef has said today, if he's going to apportion the blame game, he has to really look at his own record in this issue. And the One Scotland Many Cultures campaign has disappeared and the Relocation Advisory Service has also disappeared. He would be in a stronger position today if he had maintained those particular services. We've heard a lot about statistics today, President Officer, and I heard Stuart Maxwell say that the number of non-EU students studying in Scotland was decreasing. I'm afraid that's incorrect. I've got the HESA tables here, and I'll give them to him after the debate, but they show that the number of non the number of Scottish non-EU students studying in Scotland has increased every year from 2008 to the present day. In fact, in the last year, it's increased by 11%, and that's double the UK-wide figure of 5%. He's shaking his head again, but these are the HESA tables, and I'd be happy to provide him with them after the debate. 
We, however, agree with the Minister that the current Tory Lib Dem government immigration policy poses a significant threat to our universities. And the weight of concern from the university sector is considerable. Um, I think that he, the Minister will have more success in uniting this chamber if he doesn't over-egg it. And I'm afraid that his use of statistics today has suggested that he might. And I'm, I'll go back to the issue of colleges again. Whilst I've proven to him now that the number of students in higher education is actually increasing, the number in colleges is decreasing. In fact, it's half what it was when the Minister's party came into power in 2007. That's a 50% fall. And it's actually worth looking back at some institutions like Motherwell College, who during 2008-9 uh, had a very Aggressive approach to attracting international students to Motherwell. In fact, they had one dedicated member of staff to work in China, specifically to draw students in China to come and study at Motherwell College. It's more of that type of work that the party that we are calling on the government to look at today. There is, of course, some other issues behind the use of statistics today um, because we just don't know um, the full impact of what they tell us. We don't know what percentage of international students remain in Scotland after they complete their studies. We don't know how many want to stay and draw on the policy, such as a post-study work visa programme. And we don't know how many people want to stay long term and establish a residency in Scotland. I think we would be um, in a much better place if we had that information with us today. We've talked a lot about uh, countries where the number of uh, students coming to Scotland has fallen, and India has been mentioned uh, several times. Uh, Jim Eady mentioned it in particular and the impact it's having on Edinburgh University. But again, I asked Spice about that particular trend today, and they said that one of the contributing factors to the reduction in the number of Indian students coming to study in Scotland is a massive rapid expansion in the higher education sector in India. So one of the reasons why there are fewer Indian students coming to Scotland is actually a growth in the university sector in India, and Indian students choosing to stay in study in India. I'm not going to suggest to the member for a second that that's wholly the reason why that's happening, but it is worth putting it in context. And at the same time, I would say to him that um, the number of students in China uh, is going up and the number in, in the USA and Canada is uh, staying br broadly the same. Um, my colleague Neil Bibby was absolutely right, I believe, to introduce the issues of rest of UK fees into this debate. And I would encourage all SNP members to look at the SPICE briefing, which shows that their white uh, paper proposal is not legal. And uh, it's very clear that that is in fact the case. I would refer them to the fourth point in the SPICE briefing, where they say uh, quite clearly that the... Um, sure. Members in our last minute. All right. I'm sorry, I would very much have welcomed the opportunity to, to take Jimmy D there, but I would encourage him to look at the SPICE briefing. Neil Bibby was also correct to point to research councils, and uh, I would point uh, Christina McKelvey to some of the facts around here, because she suggested that it was done on the basis of merit and not on the basis of geography. UK research, UK research councils fund UK institutions. If you're not part of the United Kingdom, you don't have access to those funds. It really is that simple. In closing, presiding officer, can I just say we, we cannot accept the SNP's uh, position today because there is an inference there that only independents can deliver uh, for a more progressive immigration policy. Jack McConnell proved that was demonstrably not the case. We cannot support the Tory and the Lib Dem amendments because we cannot endorse the UK government's current Find immigration that out policy. Decision, thank Terry. you very much. Thanks very much. And now I call on Minister Humza Yousaf to wind up the debate. Uh, you thank you, until uh, five o'clock, uh, officer. I also uh, uh, certainly share uh, in the sentiments that have been expressed by uh, members across the chamber. I think the debate has been uh, generally fairly good. Disagreements, obviously, but the tone in the debate uh, has been fairly, fa fairly good. Uh, really. All of us have agreed that we value the contribution of international students, that they enrich our experience, not just what they bring economically, as important as that is, but that they enrich uh, our experience holistically through our, their culture, uh, through their socially, and uh, many other ways uh, as well. I'm trying to address as many points as I can in the closing remarks that I have, presiding officer. Uh, I thought, touching on, on, on colleges, I was reading Scotland's, uh, College of Scotland's uh, briefing uh, before coming here. Uh, and they, of course, uh, make mention of the UK government's policies. But they, uh, one in particular that they would like to have discussions on is about uh, attaining that uh, highly trusted uh, status. Uh, at the moment, they can only apply for that in that 12-month transitional period. Uh, and they have asked for discussions uh, with the Scottish government on that. Uh, they are ongoing. Uh, and I'm happy to update any member, in particular uh, Kezia Dugdale, who raises the question uh, on that uh, very issue. But staying with colleges, uh, I enjoyed uh, Mr Malik's uh, speech, but I, I thought he was... Uh, he mentioned waiting lists, and I want to tell him there are no waiting lists uh, at all for colleges. In fact, he attended a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary, Mike Russell, and his officials. He was at that meeting to provide evidence. Uh, to this day, he's not provided any written evidence unless he has to the contrary. Uh, of course, I will take an intervention. Mr. Malik. 
I, c I can make absolutely clear that I have not been asked to produce any evidence. However, now that I have been asked, I am happy to provide it. But I want a guarantee from the minister that he will then make places available to those students once he has the evidence. As I say, there are no waiting lists. I'm happy, of course, for him to provide that evidence, as was asked before. Uh, but there are no waiting lists. Uh, because people can apply to up to 10 colleges, uh, that doesn't mean that they're on the waiting list for all those 10 colleges. I thought Liz uh, Smith's speech was, was interesting. It was very good, uh, very measured uh, as well. Though I don't think her speech quite matches the tone of the amendment that's been put forward. Uh, most of her speech uh, was about the bogus numbers and setting the context. Uh, then her colleague, of course, Mary Scanlon, made the important point that there wasn't bogus colleges yeah, exactly. uh, here in Scotland. So why are we affected by the Conservatives' decisions in terms of removing the post-study uh, work visa? Uh, of course I will. I, th I thank the Minister for that. Uh, th the point is that the context uh, of the immigration policy for the whole of the UK, Scotland included, is uh, on the basis that there was a threat of bogus uh, visa situations, and that is not, uh, not acceptable because it damages the institutions, both as colleges and as universities. Well, I, I accept the point that bogus, bogus uh, colleges are unacceptable and that they damage our education sector, but the point Mary Scanlon was making was that we didn't have that problem in Scotland. The point is that this is very much a case of uh, using a sledgehammer uh, to crack a nut. And she mentioned in her speech that she wrote to David Willits and Theresa May, but even by her own admission, those uh, calls fell on deaf ears. I appreciate the efforts that she made. But if the UK government is not going to listen to members of their own party, what chance do we have? Why not take that power very much in our own hands? Well, the problem of this entire debate, particularly in reference to the post-study work visa, but immigration in general, was highlighted and articulated very well by Stuart Maxwell, uh, MSP. See, the definition of success in the immigration system currently by the UK government, and I would suggest even successive UK governments, the measurement of that success uh, has been in arbitrary caps, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. But that is not the measurement of whether an immigration system is good or not good, or whether it's effective or not effective. The measurement has to be, is it helping to contribute to our goals of sustainable economic development uh, or not? Uh, in terms of the post-study uh, work visa, uh, everyone agreed in this chamber that we should reintroduce it. I suppose the point we're making in this side of the chamber is that give us the powers in this parliament to do exactly what all of us uh, wish to do. I want to touch on some of the points that were made by uh, opposition uh, members, if I can. Uh, Neil Bibby uh, said that we have the le lowest levels of support for students. That is simply incorrect. I would ask him to look at NUS uh, Scotland, who describe our package of support as the best support package in the whole of the UK. That was just... Uh, in, in, in 2012. Uh, he also uh, made mention and attacked us uh, for access and not widening access when, 18, uh, when actually 18-year-olds uh, from the most disadvantaged areas are 40 per cent more likely to uh, access at university under the SNP than previous. And to talk about access, but yet he was one of those who did not vote for the post-16 bill, yeah. which mandated statutory uh, widening access, uh, really shows uh, audacity of some regard. In terms of research pools, which were mentioned by members of the opposition, uh, Neil Bibby, Liam MacArthur and others, uh, Liam MacArthur saying there's no international precedent for research collaboration. Uh, well, let me just tell him, on the 8th of November 2013, three days before the UK government's paper on research was published, uh, two UK research councils signed an agreement with the, CIS, with the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation, and so, uh, which says in paragraph 7 of that agreement, the parties agree to reciprocally open their, na uh, their nation's research project funding schemes to collaborative proposals involving researchers from any other country. Of course I will. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister uh, to take an intervention. I mean, I rather suspect that the examples he's citing um, involve collaborative uh, research funding where you get back what you've put into the pool. And what Professor Boyle was telling the committee was there is no international precedent of uh, collaborative research across border on the scale that would uh, need to exist for us to retain the benefits we get at the moment from the UK Research Council. Yeah, exactly. yes, sir. yeah we're, not, we're not asking for any more money. The Scottish Government has made it clear that we will pay our way. And if you don't believe the Scottish Government, take Professor Tim O'Shea, Principal of Edinburgh University. There is no reason why any form of constitutional change should preclude participation in higher order research councils. The research, the quality of our research will determine whether it will be funded uh, as I'm sure it will be. In terms of the students uh, from the rest of the UK, 
Uh, we know that the need from this comes from the decision, the uh, uh, terrible decision by the UK government to charge up to £27,000 for education and to take lecture after lecture after lecture from the Labour front bench in this uh, is unbelievable. This is the party, of course, that 97 uh, promised not to introduce tuition fees, then did. Promised in 2001 not to introduce toll pot fees, then did. Uh, promised, uh, of course, never to reintroduce tuition fees, then we abolished them, voted against it. And now, of course, Joanne Lamont says uh, uh, everything, everything, including student fees, is on the table. So much brass neck, presiding officer. I'm surprised they can even turn their head. Um, to end in, presiding uh, officer, the point I was making in the beginning, um, which I'll end on, is that it's incumbent upon us as politicians and political leaders to challenge attitudes. Instead of, uh, for the last year and a half, we've had those in Westminster disgracefully dancing to the UKIP tune of immigration. And while some parties have done it more, I would say to Kezia Dugdale, it is your own MP, uh, Diane Abbott, here, who says, warns Ed Miliband, don't be a milk and water farage. The Labour MP said that the party leader, Ed Miliband, risks alienating ethnic minority communities in the chase for the anti-immigration vote. So that's Diane Abbott who's making that warning to your leader. So my point is that uh, you can't out UKIP. UKIP. Yeah. Uh, that is why they romped home, of course, in England, but in Scotland, where the Scottish Government has consistently challenged them, that is why they came in fourth place. I'm the proud... Uh, no, I won't. I'm just about to finish up. I'm the proud son uh, of immigrants, but equally I'm proud... I'm very proud uh, when it comes to immigration that this government doesn't pander, it doesn't conform, but it challenges the right-wing narrative and xenophobia surrounding immigration. And only, and only through independence will we have the powers to create a fairer, controlled immigration system that will meet Scotland's educational needs, its social needs, its cultural needs as well. And therefore, I hope that, this, uh, that Scotland will see the day when we have the power to reintroduce the post-study work visa and entice Scotland, uh, the best uh, uh, students uh, across the world, uh, to Scotland, and we'll all, all be enriched uh, for it indeed. That concludes the debate on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland. We now move to decision time. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10147.3. In the name of Neil Bibby, which seeks to amend motion number 10147 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10147.3 in the name of Neil Bribby is as follows. Yes, 29. No, 70. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I remind members that in relation to the debate this afternoon, if the amendment in the name of Liz Smith is agreed, the amendment in the name of Liam MacArthur falls? The next question then is amendment number 10147.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 10147 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote in Amendment No. 10147.1 in the name of Liz Smith is as follows. Yes, 11. No, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is Amendment No. 10147.2 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which seeks to amend Motion No. 10147 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 10147.2 in the name of Liam MacArthur is as follows. Yes, 3. No, 97. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at Motion No. 10147 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the impact of immigration policy on higher education in Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote of motion number 10147 in the name of Hamza Yousaf is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 40. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That ends decision time and I now close this meeting.